Good morning. I call the Planning and Commission meeting to order. Um, I would like to welcome everybody on this gorgeous day. Um, and we will start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, has everybody... Yeah. Madam Chair, we need to go back and establish a quorum. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. I skipped I right there. I, I had all my <laughs> feeling extra patriotic okay. today. Just before we take official action, we should establish our quorum. Okay. Ms. Kirkner? Here. Mr. Lester? Here. Mr. Hoff? Here. Mr. Kane? Here. Mr. Smith? Here. Commissioner Gordon? Here. Secretary Eisenberg? Here. Madam Chair, please let the record reflect that six members are present and we do have a quorum. Thank you. Okay, now, um, has everybody had a chance to review and look over the minutes? Yes. Are yes. there any changes? No, ma'am. Okay. No I will entertain do. a motion. Uh, Madam Chair, can we re do the review and the approval of the agenda before the review and the approval of the minutes? I'm, I'm bouncing right along today, or not? Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> that's fine. Okay. Kim, we have a approval for the agenda. I move we approve the agenda for today's meeting. A second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. All right, the minutes. Um, we will need a motion, but we will need two separate ones. You notice that there was a report for the closed meeting. So we will need that to be in two separate forms, correct? That, that's correct. We will approve the minutes of the meeting with the closing statement and then there will be a separate motion and vote on approving the closed minutes. Okay, all right. I will entertain a motion and then the second. I make a motion that we approve the minutes from April 18th. And May 3rd. And May 3rd, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. I'll second that. Okay, all in favor. Aye. Aye. Okay. Now, um, uh, can you amend that to include the closing statement? Well, we'll just I make a separate, 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 a separate okay. motion. Separate. Mm -hmm. I make a motion to approve the closing or the closed meeting minutes statement. Yes, yeah. yeah, statement. Okay. Yeah. A second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, the, I have one um, thing that I did officially um, on May 4th, I approved. Excuse me, Madam Chair, we haven't gone. Um, the next order is commission member reports. Oh. That's okay. I'm just. So, and, and I think, so are we good with all of the votes then? Yeah, for, okay, we're okay, fine. So we're fine. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So commission member reports, I will. Um, report that I did one official approval, which was the City of Tawnytown Wastewater Treatment Plan, the second amended, S20-0025 on May the 4th. I approved the final plan. Commissioner Gordon. Uh, yes, just have one uh, bit of information this morning. We do have a uh, new member of planning and zoning, so we're reaching out to them, and I'm hopeful they'll probably be uh, on board within the next meeting. That's good, good news. news. Okay, any other commission members? No. no. Okay, um, Secretary Eisenberg, Yep. your administrative report. 
Yes. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here today. And as Commissioner Gordon said, we have new members coming on to our planning commission. Hopefully they will be here by the next meeting. Um, both members are going to be wonderful additions. I, I know them both, and I think we'll be very pleased um, with who's coming on board. So we'll make that official announcement um, when they officially approved <laughs> um, uh, their, their acceptance of this. So we're excited about that. Also want to let you know that the Board of County Commissioners has been very busy with um, text amendments. So it looks like four text amendments will be coming before you in July for, we've already had one introduction for one of them, um, and that was for planned commercial centers and the commercial districts. So we'll be bringing that back in July, um, as well as adult use cannabis. Um, that law goes into effect July 1 um, for the state of Maryland. So we'll be addressing that in our zoning code. Um, another issue is going to be um, self-storage facilities, uh, particularly bulk requirements where they are in proximity to residences. Um, so we'll be reviewing that. And then finally looking at um, restaurants and food services um, within the agricultural zone. We've had a couple of um, uh, issues come forward regarding that and then also there was a slight change to the state law for breweries and wineries with the allowance of on-site prepared food so not quite restaurant but um, an additional allowance for various types of foods to be prepared on site and served where the old law for that particular liquor license was only pre-prepared food could be served um, like cheese platters and prepackaged stuff now they're going to allow pizza and sandwiches and some other um, food preparation um, in association with breweries and wineries which are in our agricultural zone so um, you'll be seeing those coming in the month of july um, and with that, um, we do not have any extensions um, for this particular meeting. And I'm going to have Drew, K, Drew Gray go over with you the two BZA cases for this month. Thank you, Secretary Eisenberg. Madam Chair and um, Commission members, we have two Board of Zoning cases. We, first is BZA case 6387, which is a, re a conditional use for a contractor's equipment storage yard. The requested variance includes multiple distance variances and an area variance from the one acre requirement to 2.190 acres. This is located off of Maryland 482 Hampstead, Mexico Road, near um, the intersection of Gorsage, North Gorsage Road. Planning staff finds this request for a conditional use and associated variances is consistent with the 2014 Carroll County Master Plan as amended in 2019 and would not have an adverse effect on the current use of the property and surrounding area with the condition that a site plan be submitted to the Carroll County Bureau of Development Review. Second case is BZA case 6450. This is a request for a conditional use near the northern in intersection of Cleese Mill Road and Bartholo Road. Specifically, it is for an outdoor recreational area, an accessory caretaker's dwelling, an accessory nursing school, and all other accessory structures as shown on the drawing that was submitted. Planning staff finds this request for a conditional use is consistent with the 2014 master plan and may have an adverse effect on the current use of the property and surrounding area with the conditions that a site plan be submitted to the Carroll County Bureau of Development Review and the Zoning Administrator and or Board of Zoning Appeals reviews and approves the additional uses and buildings on the property. That is all I have, Madam Chair. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you. Um, anybody? Thank you. Thank you, Drew. Um, that concludes my administrative report for this morning. Thank you. Okay. Next is election of vice chair. Um, we will now accept nominations for the office of vice chair. I nominate uh, Michael Kane. I second that. Okay. Michael Kane, do you accept the nomination for vice chair? Yes. Are there any other nominations for vice chair? Hearing none. I need 
Okay, so um, yeah, we, we want to close. Close. Okay, I, 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 yeah. I move that we close the nomination process for vice chair. I second. I second. Yeah. Okay. All those in favor of the motion to elect Michael Kane for vice chair, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Congratulations, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you for serving. Excited and honored. Okay. Moving forward, um, Hannah Weber, Westminster Annexation. Good morning, Planning Commission. Congratulations to our new Vice Chair. Thank you. As introduced, we are here for a Westminster annexation. With us today is Kelly Schaefer, who is representing the property owner. Um, and we also have Andrea Gearhard from the City of Westminster to answer any questions. And we also have Mr. Tom Grohl, a representative from Ellsworth Cemetery, um, and Marshall Green from CLSI, who prepared the annexation plat as well. Okay. With that, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. This is just an informational briefing. There is no zoning waiver required with this annexation. The annexation area is approximately 1.1812 acres right off Lighty Road, um, adjacent to the corporate limits of the city of Westminster. We are on the eastern end of the Westminster area. You can see the corporate limits of the city of Westminster to the left of the annexation area demonstrating that this annexation will not create an enclave. Here's an aerial view of the annexation area. It is currently, um, it currently has headstones on the property. Um, you can see we have the Wawa to the um, east of, the west of the property. We have Coles, and then there is a church to the south of the property. Again, the annexation area is 1.1812 acres. As we said in the beginning, um, there is no zoning waiver required for this annexation. It is currently zoned R10,000 residential with the county. It is going to be placed into the conservation zoning district with the city of Westminster. And this is consistent with the designated land use of conservation taken from the 2007 Westminster Environs Community Comprehensive Plan. We are in the existing water and sewer service categories and the Department of Planning is recommending that the City of Westminster give public notice by posting the property prior to the date of the public hearing and notifying all adjoining property owners. We will be, we will be presenting this annexation to the Board of County Commissioners this Thursday. And then um, staff is recommending support of this annexation request. Okay. Um, so do we just need nothing? Um, well, I think it would be good if you did take a motion to uh, favorably recommend moving forward um, with the comments of the annexation. I mean, we don't really have a formal um, okay. role in this, so to speak, but this is a really great annexation opportunity. I don't know if you want to say a little bit about the cemetery. It's a really fascinating um, story, and the heart of the Civil War heritage area fully supports um, the cemetery, and I believe they applied for a grant opportunity, too, as part of um, being in the heart of the Civil War heritage area for some effort. So I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Schaefer to kind of explain a little bit to you about Thank the cemetery. You. Thank you, Linda. Good morning. Kelly Schaefer Miller, 73 East Main Street, Westminster, Maryland, 21157. Um, as I said, at the, well, I don't think I said this. Hannah said it. Um, I am here on behalf of the applicant um, and Ellsworth Cemetery group who has kind of um, t well Tom I'll let you say what exactly what you do but they manage the cemetery the cemetery had kind of fallen into disrepair had been um, vandalized headstones had been destroyed and so over several years and some of you might be familiar with this from reading the Carroll County Times and the Carroll magazine they've covered it um, v well recently um, and kind of explained the history but it has been maintained, brought back, 
Uh, the headstones are being repaired. There's been funding provided to, um, to provide some headstones for grave sites that did not have them. This is uh, the home of several Civil War veterans. It has a lot of history. I'd also like to quickly say if you follow them on Facebook, they do a, a, an awesome job kind of giving the history of some of the people who are buried there, which is really fascinating to read. So I would encourage everyone to do that. Um, <clears throat> this this annexation <clears throat> excuse me serves both a symbolic purpose but it would also uh, as linda was saying this would make this site eligible to apply for a map amendment to be brought in to the heart of the civil war heritage area which would then open the site up to additional uh, grant funding eligibility so that is one of the driving factors for this annexation we've been working with the city of westminster um, andrea gerhardt who is here from the city staff is going to help through this process as this continues because after an annexation is complete which hopefully it will be in the next few months, uh, then we will have to start the map amendment process to become part of the heart of the Civil War heritage area. Um, so this is kind of just the beginning, but it's been several years in the making. And so we've kind of developed a little team to, to guide it through this. But Tom's been involved in this for many, many years. So Tom, why don't you give them just a quick overview. I know, a quick, I think it's important. This is a really, really cool project and it's a really, uh, it has so much history. <clears throat> uh, I've been taking care of the place for about 14 years. Uh, we took a group out there to do a um, little show and tell of, of historic things in, in Westminster and, and it was neglected. And over the past 14 years, um, I've identified 182 unmarked graves. Um, I've applied and received 12 headstones for Civil War veterans from military services. Um, we're, we're working to keep the place, you know, the biggest thing that we're trying to do is we're trying to get people involved, especially the younger generation, to, to understand why this is important and, you know, the history behind it, even, even Ellsworth's name. Um, Ellsworth is from Colonel Elmer Ellsworth who was Lincoln's best friend in his law firm, helped him get elected the president. When the flag went up in Alexandria, he sent Colonel Ellsworth with his black drill team to go fetch the flag. And as you know from history, and Ellsworth went up to retrieve the flag, the innkeeper shot and killed him. Um, the troops brought Ellsworth back, and Lincoln was so distraught that he had sent his best friend to his death Colonel Elmer Ellsworth was the first person laid out in the White House, the first person killed on the, the Union side, and seven black Civil War soldiers named the, the cemetery after this first person killed there. Um, there is so much history inside the, the cemetery. Um, Nicholas Paraway, he lived to be 110, seven, day, seven months and five days. He was the first black person allowed to vote in Westminster. So there's a ton of history there. Um, my goal is through grants and things like that is to replace everybody's headstone that was vandalized and no longer has a stone. Um, and to keep this going, we're getting the Boy Scouts involved and the high schools involved so that it doesn't go through these cycles of somebody taking care of it and then it dies again. So being annexed into part of the city I think would be a great thing for this great historical place right here in our own, our own city. Amazing. We're happy to answer any specific questions that you have, but I think from the annexation standpoint this is pretty straightforward. Um, so we would request that you uh, issue a favorable recommendation to the Board of County Commissioners for our appearance there on Thursday. Thank you. Thank you. And anybody, any questions? Well, I, I uh, prior to today's meeting, I read about the history and it's fascinating. It, yeah. it really is uh, a good read and educational and certainly fits in with Westminster's history of the Civil War. I mean, it's perfect. It, it makes perfect sense so you know fully support that 
I found it interesting that the property zone R10,000, it's mm -hmm. a cemetery. How, how did that happen? Because we don't, we don't have cemetery zoning <laughs> in the county. Oh. So it's just typically whatever the surrounding okay. is. Um, and we don't have like a public conservation zoning district. Okay. So that's why. Okay. Yeah. Doesn't indicate development. Just no good. I'm, okay. No, well, no, absolutely not. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I think it's, uh, it's a perfect uh, solution to. Um, uh, the, the, the issues that the cemeteries had, and uh, good luck with you know getting more funding, certainly needed and well deserved. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody, Pete? So I, I, I would echo everything he said, and with that, unless there are other comments, I would move that we send this up the food chain with a favorable recommendation for the annexation. A second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. And thanks. That's cool. Thank very you. cool. Very, Thank very you. cool. Thank you. Thank you. These birds being so close, it's kind of forgotten that right. you know, yeah. other things. there was a lot of other things that happened. Excuse in this me, area. Madam Chair, if I can offer, if we could change the order of today's agenda and actually put item 11, the recess now, we're experiencing some technical difficulties, okay. so we need to reboot the system. Okay. okay. Um, we sure. will take a 10 minute recess. That should be fine. Okay. Right. Thank you.
for your patience yes. while we had our technical difficulties, but we are back. So, um, number 10, special report. David Beecroft. Morning. 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 Good morning. Okay. So as mentioned, the next item on our agenda is the concept special report for Bradley's Overlook, which is file number P180063. So David Beecraft with the Bureau of Development Review. We have a couple representatives of the project here and I'll let them introduce themselves. I'm Linda Alexander with CLSI with the engineers on the property. Uh, Rob Scranton with CBI Homes, uh, owner developer. Okay, and what this project is looking to do is to create four residential subdivision lots within this project. So this may look familiar to some of you. So this project was before you as a concept plan back in October of 2020. And they are now looking to this is essentially going to be a, a joint meeting here. So this is more or less a a layout revision kind of update to the planning zone commission as well as we're looking for authorization to cluster those lots now so the project itself is on the west side of cherry tree lane and you can see it outlined with this this orange outline here so this is cherry tree lane this is london bridge road here's 26 down here and here's 32 over here so you can see we're kind of in that Eldersburg area, uh, kind of on the outskirts of that. So the property itself is zoned conservation and is currently undeveloped. Uh, you can see from the aerial, the property is mostly wooded uh, with an open area here. This open area used to be an equestrian center. There is a stream that runs to the property and there is a floodplain associated with that stream. Uh, the property has pretty steep topography, uh, so if you follow the north property line down to the center of the property, it slopes down towards the stream. Once you get across the stream, it slopes back upwards as you move south to the property. So adjacent to the property are properties owned, zoned conservation and agriculture. The majority of these properties are used for private residential dwellings. Uh, as you can see, there's also some farmland that abuts the property as well. This site is outside the public water and sewer service area. So it is, and uh, as well as the surrounding properties are served by private well and septic systems. So what was originally provided to the county uh, was provided on March 25th, 2019. And that was distributed to the technical review agencies. Now I will note that with this project being submitted prior to those code changes that were adopted in 2022, this subdivision plan still falls under those old code requirements. And, and I'll kind of get into that more into the report here. So the project was um, subject to citizen involvement at the April 22nd, 2019 Technical Review Committee meeting. At that meeting, there were uh, a couple people there who expressed concerns of stormwater runoff and soil erosion during the meeting. Three adjoining property owners, uh, one who was at the meeting provided written correspondence, which was included within your packets. As already mentioned, on October 20th, 2020, the Planning Zone Commission reviewed the concept plan for this. Uh, there were no citizens that signed in or spoke at that meeting, but sometime after that meeting, the owner slash developer, as well as the engineer of the project had changed hands. And so the design along with that change of hands also ensued. So. Uh, previously, the developer was looking to create four new lots of subdivision, which were about three, maybe three and three quarter acres in size. And that left the remaining area about 17 acres. The current developer 
still wishes to create four new lots of subdivision, but they're now looking to cluster those, uh, which aligns with our current code and regulations. So the com planning commission may authorize clustering and the conservation zoning district provided the conditions outlined within county code uh, are met. And I've outlined all of those here in the report so more or less how this will go is um, I wanted to make those subsequent paragraphs line up with those requirements within that section of code. So each paragraph more or less corresponds to that section uh, in order. And so we'll move right along here. So the proposed clustered lots will range in size from about 1.75 acres to about two acres. And their clustered lots their, their lot widths will range from about 207 feet to 246 feet. So as you can see within number one, uh, it states that one of the uh, restrictions is that the individual lots shall remain a minimum of one acre in size, a minimum of 150 feet in width. Uh, with this current design, uh, it meets that, that condition. An open space calculation table provides uh, the calculation as to how much open space will have to be preserved on the property. So open space is the land derived from clustering. So the minimum lot size within conservation zoning district is three acres. Any area less than that, they have to provide that within an open space. So uh, according to their calculation, uh, the grand total op of open space area will be about 4.37 acres. Uh, they are providing 4.46 acres of open space to be provided via an open space easement on that resulting lands, which is the leftover area of property. So to determine the maximum lot yield, uh, the code states that I'm just gonna read this verbatim the total number of lots and dwelling units that would be permitted if the area were developed in conformance with its topogra topographic characteristics and the normal minimum lot size requirements. So the engineer submitted a conventional plan of subdivision to all technical review agencies. So that was the original plan back in 2019. Uh, during that review, the agencies confirmed that four lots could be attained, and that is what is shown here is four lots. <clears throat> the proposed lots are grouped on the northeastern portion of the property. Uh, as mentioned, this area is mostly open and was used as the equestrian center so this placement allows for no disturbance within the stream buffer and minimal disturbance within those forested areas that exist on the property. The open space area was declined by the county, so it, whenever you cluster, the county has the right of first refusal of that open space, and the, the county politely declined uh, that, and so uh, the open space area will be recombined with the resulting land, as I said, with that open space easement. All lot yield from the property is included on this subdivision and will be shown on the subsequent plans at such time that the Planning Zoning Commission approval is requested. A note will be added to the record plat at the time uh, that states uh, essentially no more subdivision can occur on this property. Access to the lots is proposed from a use and common drive from Cherry Tree Lane, and that is shown right here. And you'll be happy to know that there is, uh, it'll terminate at a, essentially a roundabout here so that those can, can come in and turn around easily and leave that use and common driveway. So the driveway name was approved to be Kenner Drive and is to be utilized by the proposed four subdivision lots as well as two off conveyance lots that are gonna be up here as well. And so a declaration of maintenance obligations and an access easement for the shared drive will need to be recorded with the record plat at such time that that should occur. And the resulting land will have a private driveway onto Cherry Tree Lane. So this is the resulting land and this is roughly where that resulting land house will be. So that'll have a private drive. So stormwater management has issued concept approval for the revised site layout, which utilizes dry wells and bioswales to meet requirements. Grading and sediment control have approved 
the revised plan, forest conservation, water resources, and floodplain will require easements on site. Landscape has a granted approval of the revised plan with all lots utilizing private well and septic systems. Additional information will need to be provided to the Carroll County Health Department, um, and that'll happen as we move forward in this review. In their review, the Department of Planning determined that the proposed land is consistent with the 2018 Freedom Community Comp Plan land use designation of resource conservation. And so before we move on, just to give a, an idea as to how the property looks, uh, I have a couple picture slides here. So this is essentially just various angles of that existing open area here. Uh, I will mention that these pictures are a few years old, uh, but not much has changed since these pictures were taken. So this is, uh, again, some pictures of that open space area. And then finally, this is uh, the existing access onto Cherry Tree Lane, which I, Linda, it, I believe that's going to be the same area. Close. Okay. So uh, just to give a, another idea as to the process, so as mentioned, this already went to the Planning Zoning Commission as a concept plan. I am kind of considering this also a concept plan before the Planning Zoning Commission, uh, just more or less as an update as to the design. Uh, we are looking for authorization to cluster these lots by the Planning Zoning Commission. If that should occur, this will keep moving forward in the process and will be brought back to the Planning Zoning Commission as a preliminary plan. And at that time, we'll talk about concurrency management. So if, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to help, as well as uh, the representatives here. I um, noticed that there is a trash pad site and mailbox, but where exactly on the plan is that looking to be as you go into the use in common driveway it'll be on whatever the appropriate side is that I think it's on the left hand side because you want people to be able to get in and get out so it'll be shown on that side okay will there be well I guess keep in so. mind that this use in common um, is not just 12 feet wide either it's 16 feet right so um, the pads a little bit farther over <laughs> yeah. than what it would normally be so will there be some screening around the um, trash pad site? If we can screen it and not create any issues with the site distance, yes. Okay. All right. And I'm sure that'll be addressed in the preliminary plan. Um, any other questions? I, I guess, David, I, I, I've, I've got two. Are, are we talking about four houses here or seven? Right. So it's a very good question. So with this subdivision plan they're creating four new lots okay the resulting land the land that's left over that's a buildable lot so that'll be five houses within a separate review process that does not have planning zone and commission involvement uh, they're taking two what they call off conveyance lots right. okay. so at the end of this there will be seven new lots on that property okay well right. i'm sorry six new lots and then a buildable leftover area on that property Okay, so, so we, okay, I, I just wanted to make sure, because I heard four, and I'm, I, when I looked at it last night and, and the first time, so I've got seven houses, and I read, okay. All right, then I'm going to go back to, are we using the new code, or are we doing this under the old code? Because it sounds to me like we're allowing them, we're giving them some allowances because they were here early on. And we don't want them to have to restart the process but we're also trying to leverage some of the benefits of the new code so we're kind of this is a little bit of a hybrid so this is solely under the old code okay. so um really the only thing that changed that would affect this with the new code was how how many lots are allowed and how that's provided so under the old code they had to show us a conventional plan to prove to us that they can have that many lots right. under the new code it's just a calculation you have this Got it. many acres you can get this so, so that's the only thing they're doing here is this the the accommodation we made where you don't have to provide the the, the two plants and go through the approval process for both or whatever. Correct. And essentially, uh, be right. because they already, the original plan was a conventional plan, they weren't proposing to cluster at the time. We just considered that the conventional plan. I understand. All right. I appreciate the clarification on that because I was kind of, okay, if 
it sounded to me like we were kind of using the best of both. So I appreciate you clarifying that. Yeah, of course. You. And uh, I will mention, too, by all means, uh, it is very well possible that they could be put under the new code. But as you mentioned, they would have to start over from the very beginning. I don't want to wish that on anybody. But, um, <laughs> but I mean, I don't think it's, uh, you know, whatever. You're, we're, okay. That's, I'll be quiet. Okay. It's okay. You don't have to be. Anybody else? What's the uh, width of the driveway to access the homes? 16. 16 feet. 16, 16 feet. Is that, and that's adequate for emergency uh, 12 feet is the minimum. That's the we're minimum. doing 16. Okay. And you'll have a like a turnaround back yes, there. Yes, it has a full blown. The, the, the uh, turnaround that's at the end of this is as large as a cul-de-sac is on a public road. Okay. And the newer homes are all built with sprinkler systems and things Correct. like that anyway. Because mm -hmm. I noticed the, what, the fire hydrant was two and a half miles away or something. Mm -hmm. They're all sprinkler. That's a lot of hose. <laughs> but, um, okay. All right, good, good questions, Pete, because I, I had the same things written down when I was looking at this last yeah. night. Uh, six, seven, four. Well, let me. one of the reasons that the off conveyances are actually still shown on here mm -hmm. is we needed to make sure stormwater management was okay conceptually with how the whole site worked, mm -hmm. not just piecemeal it, which is basically the new power. You know, that's happened in it. over the past year or so. That's been an evolving thing. So that's the reason the off conveyances are still shown on here was to get concept approval. Okay. So, and that lot yield is capped, but only by uh, when the the, uh, the plat is recorded with that note saying no more development. So we'll have to be watchful for that when we see that uh, submit. Keep in mind too that when the plat comes in, one of the reasons that this was done is the majority of this resulting land is forested, yeah. and under the conservation zone, it's required to be put in an easement. So once it goes into those easements and the floodplain easements and, and the water resource protection, uh, there's not a whole lot Shrinks of land down. left. Now, the off conveyances on this meet the current zoning of conservation. There are three acres or more. Okay. Only the four lots are being clustered now. And the resulting land is pretty steep. Too. Yes. So the, where we're showing the house, there's about three acres, maybe four acres in that area that's usable. But then it comes down to easements and steep and... Yeah. yeah, I've been by there. <laughs> yeah, the original, the original plan um, went over into those uh, those areas, and uh, when we got involved, we wanted to reduce the environmental impact and kept all. That's why we're asking for a cluster to keep everything um, on the other side of the stream. <laughs> that, oh, okay, <laughs> work. <laughs> uh, and that will be property owner maintained road, not county maintained is that correct it will be privately maintained that's correct yes. so they, they will have to record a declaration of maintenance obligations for the the users of that without county involvement and there's the, dr the driveways have some climb to get mm -hmm. to the homes too so good sleigh riding <laughs> <laughs> right into the road yeah, yeah. Well, scary thought um, okay so we need a motion to so, um, if I may, so I, I believe there is someone from the public here as well to comments. Public comment. <clears throat> public comment. Okay. Yeah. Public comment. Um, someone would like to speak on this. If you could please come up to the microphone and state your name and address for the record and uh, this for this comment item. Absolutely. Yep. I can pass them up. Sure. Uh, if you hand them to me, I'll take them. Uh, oh. oh, okay. <laughs> walk up to the dais then. <laughs> what do you want me to do? You, you can walk up to the dais then and show them the pictures. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Ed Derenberg, Good morning. and my property is attached in Maryland Ag Land Preservation Project. And I have a very bad e um, erosion problem. And that is right here. That's Dan Pennington from Soil Conservation go out. I got two letters. Uh, what's happening is <clears throat> the erosion is getting so deep, I'm losing my <coughs> fence line. And I have pictures of this. This is from 2019. <clears throat> 
I'm losing my fence line, and eventually I'm going to be on the, which was the Bradley property. See how bad that is? All the water, <coughs> see, it's a big hill. Mm -hmm. All the water is going down and destroying my property. There's another picture. Okay, so I just want to understand so the the erosion's taking place from the Bradley's top of the, the top of this hill. Of course, if, if you haven't been there, you wouldn't see the hill. You can't see the hill here. So it goes down the hill and, and eroding all my water, it's eroding all my property. So my fence line is almost. I have like mm, five or six more feet, and I won't have any more room to move my fence. So Stan Pennington came up with this idea. Could we, uh, David, could you put the picture up there that uh, Mr. Derenberger is referring to of the property? Because I couldn't see the picture where you're. Well, we don't have his pictures, but. So, no, this, no he, he's Derenberger. using the, the, he's the using right. okay. He lives on this property here. Okay. I have 21 acres attached to. Okay. okay. Stream Did you want me to, right and here. where's the erosion occurring? Erosion. It, it starts at the top here. It's okay. Extreme. He's upstairs. It, it, it rolls down the hill. And this is my fence line. We're not eroding him. It was my uncle's farm, part of Pooldale's farm, which is 500 acres. And I got 21 of it. You know, going back to here. Up to this corner here, I cross the stream. Now, I do have pictures of this stream in, a, in the 100 year floodplain. It's dangerous, and humans can't. I don't allow, I own a horse farm. I do not allow anybody down there. <coughs> I picture that. That's true. So it comes in, the water comes down through here. I can't see where he's pointing. Rolls down and, and it's, well, it's probably 15, 20 feet deep. That's possible. So, so Stan Pennison said there's a, a, a in the report about a, right. a pond. A stormwater hmm. retention. Yeah. Now here's here's another question that. Uh, Mr. Smith from the uh, Ag Land Preservation, he said, came up with this idea um, on the drawing. The possibility, this is up to you guys, okay, if they could donate this land to me, then they wouldn't have to worry about having a stormwater pond. I wouldn't have to worry about erosion. And then this is the other thing that's happening. Well, there is target shooting. There is no trespassing. All the trees in this area. When I cleaned it up, and these are this is my fence line. You can see, eighty foot trees fell over. They knocked sixty feet of my fence. Now, who's who's responsible for that? Can I see? This is brand new. This just happened. I well, I understand that. I just had a neighbor's tree. Fall over them. I mean, I took fence, care of it. So. I didn't go to the Bradleys or whoever owns this property and mm -hmm. fix it. I just did yeah. it. Because I raised cattle down in that field. Okay. Well, I think you, uh, the, the issue here, yeah, I think, is, is that there's an erosion problem before we've done anything. And right. if we're not increasing runoff, you, the problem is still going to exist whether we do anything or not. If, well, if we're not increasing well, unless runoff. Unless they do the pond, Stan said they have to do a pond thing where the water would not go through. It's, it's so I think it'd be appropriate to not continue to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation um, so the rest of the public can hear and it's on the record and that the applicant can have an opportunity to respond um, to the questions that were just, and, and the problem that was just proposed. So, so the other thing too is the majority of, I think I know potentially where he's talking about, we're not proposing any work at all back in that area because we're leaving all those woods the way they are. So nothing we're doing is going to make the situation worse, but nothing we're doing is going to make the situation better. There's a stream down there, and there's in the chances of the county, for, um, immaterial of what the soil conservation, in, um, water resource protection, forestry, floodplain, are not going to let us put a pond down in the bottom of that. And we are downstream of him, so his stream is actually completely coming on us, except for that one potential area that's running across the back. Um, as far as donating land, I, I can't speak to that portion of it. Um, it doesn't fix the problem. It just puts it to where he can potentially maintain it. But 
Um, it's something that we can, I mean, it's the clustering that we're doing, we're not even going the whole way back to that property. That's gonna be part of that resulting land back in there with no work proposed in that area. And any of the stormwater and any of the sediment is gonna be contained before it even hits the woods in that location. And that would result when you do the preliminary Correct. plan. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know what, there is target shooting there. I mean, that's, and I'm not going to stop that. Do you know? My, my, on my side, right by the screen, and it's very loud. What is that you do with me? I'm already having problems with the family that just developed on my family farm already. So please come and say, they're target shooting. I have a farm too, I'm quite familiar with <laughs> the neighboring uh, issues. Now, do you want to see anything about the flood, the floods that are happening on this property? Do you want to see that? We can certainly take copies of them, or Absolutely. the county can. And I have to, I it have would to, probably be better I'm for the. the you guys want to see this? I, I, I think. I, I'm going to ask you, Edwin, to go back to the microphone um, and uh, so that everybody can hear you when you're talking. Right. Um, so if you could go back. I would think that to, for our purposes, yeah. I would rather the county had the pictures and then they can share them with us. Yeah, I think the most appropriate thing to do is anything that you want to submit as record for the for public record is to yeah, hand it to Mr. Yeah. So hand it to Mr. Beecroft and he can make copies and return the pictures to you. I went to you years ago and they went to uh, Brian, Mr. Frock, I think it was. Myron Frock, yeah, he does the stormwater management. Is there anything else from the pile that is yours, sir? Yeah. Um, no idea where this we is. Have, uh, He's reading over the notes. Over Michael, so, so I, you know, I asked the question mm -hmm. you know, that was raised <laughs> to Mr. Pennington. What, what are there any, uh, how many ha of the house lots affect the watershed? And what I'm hearing is the answer is none. Correct. Sorry, man. Sorry. Sorry. We were looking at the pictures. Yes. Right. There was only one house that's back that far, and it's one of the off conveyances, and it's at the top of the hill. And the stormwater is going to be controlled into dry wells coming off the house itself, right, right. and everything else will be stabilized. Mr. Pennington. Oh. Thank you. This comes Mr. Pennington. Oh, Here. Here's your letters. Thank you for sharing. And thank you. We appreciate it. Okay. Oh, yes. Yeah, they got yes, I think if you could yeah, um, share it with them, and David could possibly you guys want to sit make copies. Or you, or the meeting, or you want to learn how this works? We'll, we'll, Sir, we'll review it. They're going to put it in the record. Yeah. Sir, we're still, we're still taking public comment, and this meeting still has to go on, and we have a, other public comment to take for this so item. So I, th I think we're done with this portion, and we're going to call some other folks up to see if there's any additional comment, and then you can speak with them at your leisure out after they're done okay, okay. Right. thank you so much okay uh, any other public comment on this okay okay seeing none um, we would need a request for authorization to cluster I'll make a motion that we um, authorize the uh, plan to cluster for Bradley's Overlook. I'll second that. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Then um, the request stands approved. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, we took our recess, so we will move right along. Um, no, stay there. You're, you're <laughs> David's next. Great. Good feelings for Okay, David, you're up. All right. Thank you. So next on the agenda is um, a concept site plan. 
which is for Good Feelings Farm, file number S-22-0008. So David B. Craft, Bureau of Development Review. Let's speak over here for you. And we have a, a few representatives for the project here, and I'll let them introduce themselves. Yeah, good morning, Commission. Uh, Randy Bechtel with BPR Surveying. Shell McAleer, BPR Surveying. Good morning, everybody. My name is Matthew Lazuriaga. I've been uh, Ms. Stewart and her LLC's attorney in the beginning before the Board of Zoning Appeals and through today. I'm Karen Stewart. I'm one of the owners of the property. Thank you. Okay, so this concept site plan is before you. Uh, so the owner developer is proposing and currently operating a country inn on the property. And as said, stated, this is before you as a concept plan, so there's no action required. However, as with every site development plan, the Planning and Zoning Commission may consider delegating approval of the final site plan to the chair. So the property itself is located at 125 Kate Wagner Road. And for those that are unfamiliar, so it's highlighted here. Uh, this is Kate Wagner Road. This is 32. And if you're familiar, uh, this is the high school and the career and tech center up here. So the property currently contains about 14 acres and it currently hosts uh, a residence on site. There are horses on site. There's various outbuildings on site. And then as stated, there is a country inn on the property as well. So on February 24th, 2021, the Board of Zoning Appeals granted a conditional use for a country inn on this property. Along with that approval, they uh, added seven conditions to that. And those conditions created limitations on the frequency of events that could occur, uh, the size of the events that could, could occur, and then the timing of those events as well. So the subject property is zoned agriculture and it does have a gradual slope south away from Kate Wagner Road. So the further you go onto the property, the, the, you know, it, it slopes downward. There is a stream that crosses through the property, but there is not a FEMA 100-year floodplain designation on site. So although the property is partially wooded, as you can see from the aerial, the majority of the property is open ground. So the southern and eastern adjoining properties are zoned agriculture, so these two here, and they either host a private residence or are undeveloped. The adjoining property to the west is also zoned agriculture and it's fixed with an electrical substation on site. And then those properties across K Wagner Road are either zoned R40,000 or R20,000 and host private residences. So the subject property and all of those adjoining properties are served by private well and septic systems. And those adjoining properties across the road are served by uh, public water and sewer. So those south of K Wagner are private well, and then those to the north are private or public water and sewer. So the concept site plan was submitted on March 29th, 2022 to the Bureau of Development Review and that was distributed to the review agencies. The site plan was subject to citizen involvement on April 25th, 2022. Various comments were received, both verbal and written. Written correspondence was provided within your packets. Uh, so the comments received pertain to the concerns of additional traffic with this use the noise and public safety as well. So the plan proposes to utilize the existing residence, the existing garage and an existing concrete pad for the country in. So the residence is shown as being here. This right here is the garage and over here is a concrete pad that's used for the country in use. A 100 foot by 40 foot concrete pad over here is also on site and it is for the placement of an event tent. A 12 foot wide gravel driveway connects this concrete drive, or I'm sorry, this concrete pad back to the existing driveway. And there is a metal pole building and a wood barn, and those are shown here, and those are not 
as part of this country and use. They're on site um, for, I, I believe, for the, the agricultural use on site, but not for the, the country and use. So access to the parking areas will be via the existing um, driveways. So the one 12 foot wide gravel driveway here and then the other 12 foot wide paved driveway here um, to this one parking spot for the country in use. So code states that a two way access drive has to be 18 feet wide. Uh, there was a variance that was requested in accordance with code and that a variance was granted by the director So they are able to to keep that 12 foot wide designation in lieu of the 18 foot wide requirement So based on the projected trip generations with this use a traffic study is required however as the Board of Zoning Appeals imposed a limitation on 12 events per year between May and October, a waiver to this study was requested to the Department of Public Works. The Department of Public Works agreed to waive this requirement with the conditions that a deceleration and an acceleration lane be added onto Kate Wagner Road to access the site, as well as relocating the access of the site. So you can see this is the new access to the site. This existing access shown here is to be removed and returned to grass. And then you can see a deceleration lane running off the page here and then an acceleration lane being added onto Kate Wagner, uh, which should make for safer transitions into the site. So these conditions have been incorporated into the plan and the traffic study was waived. Uh, with that engineering review has granted approval of the concept plan. So code states that the parking requirements for a country inn is, and I'll, I'll just read it verbatim, one for each guest bedroom plus one for each employee on the maximum shift. So there's no new employees projected with this. It'll just be run by the stewards. Uh, so one parking space is shown at the residence and the country inn as stated. Uh, being located right here. Uh, code also states that parking requirements for an assembly hall is one for every three persons and that's based on the maximum capacity. So one of the other limitations the Board of Zoning Appeals imposed on this is a maximum of 250 guests for these events. And so that's the calculation we used was to base it off of that 250 guests. Uh, with that, 84 parking spaces are required. Those 84 parking spaces are shown up here as being on uh, the existing grass. And then as well as uh, four parking spaces over here for uh, the handicapped spaces. Uh, so the code states that parking is to be constructed on a durable and dustless material, uh, meaning grass is generally not allowed for that. However, with... Um, with the limitations that was imposed by the Board of Zoning Appeals, a request was uh, submitted for a variance to that requirement so that they did not have to provide additional paving for those 84 parking spaces. Uh, and in accordance with code, as stated, they, they did submit that request and it was granted by the Director of Land and Resource Management. So they are able to maintain those grass parking spaces without having to pave that. So as mentioned, the property is served by private well and septic systems. However, for events, an ADA compliant portable restroom trailer is to be parked near the event tent and that's shown as being parked right around here. And essentially that is to be used uh, by the guests so that they're not overloading the system that's on site. So the, the site is located within the no planned water and sewer service area. Uh, per the Carroll County Water and Sewer Master Plan, and the Carroll County Health Department has granted approval of this concept plan with what's being shown. So the zoning office did provide additional comments that relate to the size and lo the location of the existing sign that was to be addressed on the final site plan. Um, so just as a background, the sign exceeds the size requirements outlined with Carroll County Code uh, it states that the sign is 
allowed to be a maximum of three square feet. The existing sign on site is shown as being 12 square feet. So it was, um, a request was received to permit the sign to stay 12 square feet to the zoning administrator. And it was determined that with the sign not causing interference with incoming or outgoing traffic, with it not being lit, and with no opposition having been received by the office, the zoning administrator allowed that sign to stay 12 square feet in size. So forest conservation and landscaping have approved this plan. Water resources will require an easement at the stream with additional details to be provided on the final site development plan. And the project is exempt from the code requirements of floodplain management. Stormwater management will be provided through the construction of an infiltration berm, which is shown as being up here. And, and they will also have sheet flow to the conservation area on site. Stormwater management has granted concept approval of the plan. So in accordance with the site development plan memorandum from the Department of Planning, the land use is consistent with the 2014 Carroll County Master Plan land use designation of agriculture. And finally, uh, the final site plan will be tested and reviewed for adequacy of public facilities uh, before being brought for final approval to either the full commission or the chair. So before we, we move on, just to give those an idea as to how the site looks, I'm going to show a few picture slides here. So this is that 100 foot by 40 foot concrete pad that's used for the invent tents, these top two pictures here. This bottom picture is the concrete pad that is right outside the wooden barn that is used for the country in use. These are some shots of that existing gravel driveway that branches off that existing paved driveway. And then finally, these are some shots of, now this is the, the old, or I'm sorry, this is the existing site entrance. Um, but as stated, this will be moved to be further down the uh, Kate Wagner Road. And then finally, this is the sign that's on site. So this sign is, I guess, 12 square feet. So if you have any questions, I'll be happy to, to answer them as well as those here with me. Gentlemen. I would just like to add, David did a very nice job presenting this thing. We, we, we feel like that the site plan is in its final state, uh, contingent on some of the details that you have to do for stormwater management easements and those kind of things. The sign, if David goes back to the sign, the storts have been on this property since 1976. The sign has been here for, that, that, was, that was the name of the farm long before Karen came up uh, with the idea for a, a wedding venue. So, you know, that sign's been there. And the, the other thing I think too, having been around a long time here, this is one of those ag remainders. And I think this is an excellent use, an alternative use, because it does, a property does not lend itself to being farmed uh, as an agricultural operation. Uh, the Storts did, did uh, house a few horses around over the years, but other than that, if you look at the site, I'm, I imagine you've been there, uh, it's not conducive to farming, but I think it's a very, very good use for one of these small ag remainders that we create over the years. Thank you. Any other comments? I don't have any unless you have any questions of me. I do not. Tell me, tell me about lighting around the property for the, the venues. Back to the plan. Can you enlarge that any, David, to show them where the lighting is? Or? Yeah, that's a good question. There is, there is some lighting at the entrance up. Here we go. That's about all I got, Randy. Yeah. You, <coughs> you can see where the three arrows are. And then there's a small light post up at the entrance of the, where, where it uh, exits the driveway to the top right there. Go down just a little bit, David, right at the other entrance. Oh. Up here? And over to the left. Yeah. Right there. Existing, right where exist, the EXLP, existing lighting. It's lighting that's there. There's one on each side. Yes. And lighting for the parking area? There won't be any lighting for parking area, or will it be temporary lighting, or? 
Can I, yeah, can I come? Sure. No, we have lighting. The first one you can see as you're coming down the driveway, the three arrows where it says existing light pole. Drive. So, light. yep, right there. That's right. the first one. Down on the building that you said is not a part of the um, use, there is also a light on the corner of the building. And they're, they're the, the larger magnification. I don't know what the term is. Um, there's lighting on the garage that's being used as the country inn. Um, there's lighting on the side of the house. There's lighting down at the restroom trailer. There's lighting, uh, a large light post. You can see it, he's designated it down there as well. So it is fully lit, especially when people are leaving the event so they can get to their cars safely and leave safely. So where's the lighting where the, the tent will be? Existing LP, you see that, and then existing outdoor light there to the left of the trailer. It's on a large pole. I don't know, my husband may have to speak for how tall the pole is. And the light has been professionally installed by an electrician okay. so that it projects out how far? They're light falcons. So they're light falcons. falcons. But there is no true parking within the parking spaces, the 84 spaces that's showing there. There's no light poles within that area. And what's the topography to the property behind, you know, along, what is it, the 12 foot stone drive? What, what is that topography? Is it up a hill, down a hill? So I'll, the substation. Move. I'll go back to those picture slides. Um, actually, actually, it goes downhill from Kate Wagner Road to the tent site. The property to the right is uh, a substation for BG&E. Okay. So uh, the right of the driveway. I'll mention too. So this picture on the top left was taken down close to where that concrete pad is. Okay. And so you can you can kind of see the the slope as you move down. So the the road is up here. David, do you have any, uh, and the other thing is the water resource protection easement, and you can see the screening to the left on that previous slide. That's screening the substation, mm. and then there's trees below, below the tent area that's being placed in that water resource yeah. uh, protection area. So it's really kind of hidden from the neighbors for the most part. Any other comments from you all? No? Okay. Um, do we have any public comment? Okay. I, I, would, I would just comment that, you know, we've got several properties like this in the county that are in relatively close proximity to residences. and. When I read through, David, when I read through your verbiage, I see a couple of related permit violations and that sort of thing, and we don't deal with that. I don't necessarily believe here. And so it, it would be out of the ordinary for me to say that something like that has an impact on what we do here. It doesn't, but then it does in that when we hear noise in the paper about noise, about traffic and that sort of thing, it does impact what we do and, and how we perceive venues like this. I personally like them. Um, I like attending a venue, I like attending events at, at places like this. I think it's a creative thing. As, as a business owner, I wish you luck. At the same time, collectively as a group, when we permit a place for 250 people, and we end up with three or 400 people there, you know, we, we do hear about it. And um, when a venue is supposed to shut down at 11 and it goes to 11.30 because everybody's having a great time, that's great, good for them. But that's not what we, were, we are supposed to allow on those properties. At some point, we're probably going to need a noise ordinance. And we've, we've tried to get away from that because you know, who's going who's gonna to enforce it, right? You know, who's going to go out there with a meter and say, you know, this, this event's too noisy and that one's not. So I'm kind of rambling here, but I'll just simply say, you know, 
I would encourage you to to do what you're allowed to do and 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 not push the envelope because if you do it will definitely impact others who want to do the same some something similar and it may come back to to to, to bite you too um, and I don't know how else to say it other than when I read it I was kind of um, concerned well I I do think you've run some wedding venues from there already correct we've had 24 yes okay. and mm -hmm. over the past year there has not been a single complaint we stop at 10 o'clock i have a decibel reader and i sit at the top of the driveway so i respect everyone's privacy and noise immediately stops at 10 o'clock we only also i only host 200. you've all granted me 250 um, guess but we only do 200 it's too many to have 250 so yeah. 200 is the maximum that I choose to do and that's in all of my PR and in my contract so okay. mr. Lester may I inquire i um, not knowing uh, the benefit of everything that you have in front of you I've not had a chance to review it when you utilize the word um, violation my ears kind of go up so I don't know if it's correspondence that you received from members of the public that might uh, predate the uh, last time Ms. Stewart was in front of the BZA, not her initial uh, application. But just to speak on her behalf here, because that's my job, um, this has been a long process for her where she has taken into account virtually every single comment from a neighbor, uh, whether they've just done it uh, by email or whether they've come and spoken at a hearing or they've requested a hearing that they didn't bother to show up at, particularly about the size of her sign. Um, so she has taken every effort that she can to adjust what actually happens and does, in my opinion, a fantastic and remarkable job to manage uh, this great use. So if there's any specific violation, I, I was just curious if you could point me to that. Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to, to grow without rather than read it into the record or anything like that. I'm happy to provide you with the information we were provided. Um, and I'm sure David can do it as well. That's fine. It, it's not, it's nothing glaring here, but you know, just when you, when you read something like that, you just, your antennas go up. And so, and not only that, again, it's not this venue, right? Sure. There's some, there's some other venues that, that, you know, we all read about it in the paper. We, it's noise not from your development it's noise around this industry where people are saying wow you know we bought this home here and that wasn't there and it was supposed to be a putt putt golf course and now they're having events there in live bands that's a different thing than what was approved and so this is different right but it's all connected right and and again we have talked about noise ordinances on this commission do we need one and at some point we probably will because you know we're nice, law-abiding. We all get along. We we get yeah. we have our, you know. Let's not violate each other's good nature. Sounds like you're not. Um, but again, I, I just I, I just wanted to say it out loud. We, we're seeing more and more of these, and as we do, we also you know from churches and and re, uh, yeah. we had something what, last month about a um, or a couple of months ago about a a, a religious center that it was was. You know, it's it's more than what they pretend it to be, that kind of thing. And so, you know, yeah. you're, you're permitted for 250. You're holding it to 200. I, I applaud it, right? So there's going to be somebody like me who has a daughter who wants to have a 300-person wedding, and we're going to push you, right? Um, don't let us. I, I, so, well, I, I think we're here to discuss Good Feelings Farm. Yeah. And I hear you and understand the frustration I'm not sure the noise ordinance is totally in our ballpark, but. Um. Well, uh, yes, just for the uh, commission's edification. So there is a, a noise ordinance, and it used to be, um, as Mr. Lester said, really dependent on those decibel readers. But practically, we found that working with our zoning office and the sheriff's department, that was hard to put into practice because those meters a are very expensive and need to be like updated like you know apple products they're updated all the time which is even more expensive so um we got together with the sheriff's office 
and really put the onus on them to enforce unreasonable noise, which there are First Amendment implications to that. Um, but it's really in the discretion of the sheriff's department to enforce uh, noise issues if there's an unreasonable noise and there are violations attached to that. And then also, um, if there are any violations of the conditions that the Board of Zoning Appeals put on to this project, the zoning office is able to enforce um, those. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you for that. Um, so any other <clears throat> comments? Okay, then we need a motion to, oh no, do we need a motion? No, it's, it's the well, we could delegate the approval of the final site plan to you. I would make that motion I'll to know that. delegate it to Janice. <laughs> Is there I'll, a second? I'll second that. <coughs> okay. Uh, any other discussion? Okay. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Then good luck to you. Um, I look forward to seeing the final plan. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um. <clears throat> so, Kirsten Marple, come on up. over here is nice I can see this little screen over here good morning everybody good morning I am Kirsten Marple with Carroll County's Bureau of Development Review I have for you today a final site plan for a project called drill tech file number s 210029 um, this was before the Planning Commission somewhat recently in September September, I believe, for concept review. It should look familiar. Um, well, before we get into the plan review, if I could have everybody introduce themselves over here, please. Um, I'm Jeff Ziegler with CLSI. I'm Jason Reinhardt, uh, project manager with Joel Tech. Thank you very much. Okay, so yes, this plan should look familiar. Um, we saw this recently for a concept review, and at that time it was requested by the Planning Commission that it come back for final review before a consideration of approval like I said this is drill tech this is a site located in the northeastern portion of the county it's this chunk of red right here it's just outside the town of Manchester you can see the town limits is this uh, fuchsia line um, that borders the property this property is not proposed to be annexed this property is in an annexation um, eligible area, but it's not within water sewer service area um, and it's being processed under county regulations. And so 16.5 acres there is the site. Bring it in here. We're on the east side of Route 30. The site's currently undeveloped. The site currently has a driveway entrance. There used to be a house on the property. Um, there's a house that was served by well and septic. The house is gone, but the driveway, the well, and the septic system are still in place. These orthographic images are a little bit outdated. I wanted to show you here. This is for the perspective of the end of the driveway. Looking back, you'll see a structure there. That's a construction trailer um, for preparation of construction. That was placed there, but has not been utilized in any way since it was located on site. Um, but they're waiting to, to break ground to use that one. So we'll bring us back to our site here. And this is commercial medium zoning district within the county, like I mentioned. Um, the site is mostly a flat field, well, somewhat graded, and it slopes down towards a stream on the eastern edge of the property. You can see there's some pretty dense forest around that stream. It's, it's a bit of a slope down there, like I said. <coughs> also along the northern portion of the property as well, there's a forest boundary there. 
So what's being proposed on this site with this final site plan um, for which the, we are seeking final approval for today is a building for a uh, repair facility garage and an attached office for drill tech. Um, drill tech drilling and shoring works within this state and other states surrounding. This would be the repair facility for their vehicles, for their equipment. This is not like a Jiffy Lube or something like that. This is not open to the public. This would be specifically for drill tech's vehicles. Uh, okay, so they are proposing a building on the property It'd be on the side facing Route 30. We're, we've shifted our, our view a little bit here, but the stream is over here on the right. The Route 30 is over here on the left. Proposing to utilize the existing driveway entrance and upgrading that to be a commercial entrance onto Route 30. Um, likewise, along Route 30, you can't really see it from this image, it's pretty small, but they're also proposing a sidewalk, the full length of the property along Route 30. Um, there are sidewalks in the area and this will connect the area uh, in a walkable area. So coming off the full access driveway here to enter the site, the area will be gated as well, with fenced and gated with chain link, and then we'll come into the parking lot area, 24 parking spaces, which meets and exceeds the 22 number of parking spaces, which is the minimum requirement. The parking wraps around the back as well, which also leads through um, drive-through garage entrances for the repair facility. And the office is the portion of the building here to the west. The main doors for the office, in fact, face Route 30. And there will be a building mounted sign on this portion of the garage that you can see above the office building. Um, that is the only sign proposed for the building. Um, as well as there are no freestanding <coughs> signs proposed for the site. It's all building mounted signs. And the photometric plan that's provided shows that that light is limited to um, within the boundaries of the property. Shielding has been provided, in fact, for a redirection of the floodlight, rather, for a light that previously on the plan that we looked at at Concept, I believe, shined across the street. We had received uh, calls from um, neighbors over there. So that's the basics of the site layout. I don't want to hop around too much, um, but like I said, you had seen this before in September for a concept review. Um, prior to that, it was also before us for a technical review committee meeting. And throughout the duration of the review of this project, we've received quite a bit of public inquiry, um, quite a bit of questions and concerns from neighbors and concerned citizens, the town as well. Um, there's quite a bit of a packet there that you received to review prior to this meeting that was inclusive of that. Um, there was also an email that was sent to the Planning Commission last week and today um, following up with other concerns and questions that public members had. We'll touch on that a little bit here as we go through the more technical portions of this project. And I will also note too at the Planning Commission meeting in September the Planning Commission had discussed and also requested that additional landscaping be provided. That was the one um, main takeaway re request for that through that meeting. I uh, wanted to note that that was addressed and we'll get to that when we get to the Planning Commission, or excuse me, when we get to the um, landscaping plan. So to get to the more technical situation and the concerns that were held by the public, I'm gonna zoom out a little bit. So this site, like I had mentioned, has a stream on it that obviously connects to other streams. That's the way that, that works. Um, to the east of the site, there are also municipal wells for the town of Manchester. Um, the, none of them are close enough to be in this image, but they're, they're within this region here, which as you can see is to the east of the site, which is um, of a concern for members of the public as well as the town of Manchester. So I wanted to bring that those concerns were brought up before we get into <coughs> the stormwater management system here, because I'm gonna go into a bit of nitty gritty detail there because it is important for this site. There was a lot of attention on the stormwater management system for this site. I'm gonna describe that in some detail. So there were concerns about runoff from this property, especially considering the use being a repair facility, potentially impacting um, the quality of the streams, particularly because there is a uh, active population of 
I think it's brook trout, um, a, a, a fish on that, yes, native brook trout that's active in that stream there um, that was of a concern, sensitive species, as well as, of course, the proximity of the municipal wells in that area and the property that the wells are on is also a public park that the town maintains. Um, so people like to enjoy nature there and didn't want to see it damaged by any potential uh, local development. So this project here, it's a repair facility and the Maryland Department of Environment classifies different types of projects in different ways and there's different regulations applicable to those projects. A repair facility like this is considered what's called a hot spot. Um, it's understood that there's a potential for, that's a greater potential for pollution discharge than would be on some, some other certain types of sites. Um, so there are special regulations for hot spots. Our stormwater management office is very familiar with that um, and ensure that those regulations were addressed through this review process. So there is quite a bit of detail with the stormwater management. I want to start on this page here because this shows you where the parking lot's going to be and the repair facility. This also shows the grading. And I know it's hard to see because there's a lot of lines. There's going to be a good bit of grading on here because what's being proposed is a swale system that conveys water to a underground stormwater management facility. So these dark lines here, there's little arrows, and they show you the directions of the swales. And they go from towards Route 30, around the parking lot, to this stormwater management system that is an underground facility. So the swales as well as that underground facility are reviewed according to the hotspot requirements. And that requires that the stormwater managed, stormwater coming from the site is not allowed to just flow off the site and get soaked into the ground because then you might have the contaminants go into the ground and when it's in the ground, it goes into the water. So what they require is lining. They require a, uh, a membrane, which is a fancy, a waterproof membrane, membrane, which is a fancy word for plastic, a nice heavy duty sheet of plastic or a rubber-like material um, to ensure that the water that flows off the site goes to the stormwater management system here, in this case, the underground facility and the contaminants or potential contaminants are absorbed by the filter media in that facility. So the facility itself is lined to allow for the contaminants to be captured before the cleaned water is slowly, very slowly, discharged underground um, from, that, from the underground facility. So that is the basic requirement for MDE for the hotspot. In this situation, understanding the use of the property and the proximity of the natural resources and um, the wells, the stormwater management office found it necessary to also line the swale systems as well um, to make sure that all of the water coming off the site goes to the, the facility before it's infiltrating into the ground. Um, so that is the water is essentially contained until it is captured and treated before it is discharged and it's discharged very slowly um, through that facility as well. So the, the point of bringing all that up and describing all that in and, and such riveting detail is, is to, to explain that it's understood that there's a potential for pollution on this property, um, same way there is on, on really any road or from any vehicle or repair facility. So it was considered through the review process and addressed by means of stormwater management. Um, this use is allowed on this property. This is a business zone property. It's not a matter of the use shouldn't be there. It's a matter of how do we make this use work with where it is. And that's what stormwater management strive to do here. I'm not a stormwater management engineer, but this is a pretty in-depth um, solution here to these concerns. So I'd be happy to answer any questions about that anybody might have moving forward, but I'm going to get through the rest of this review here. So. Okay, so this is where the driveway entrance is now. Right now it's just gravel. It used to be for a house. Like I said, that would be widened and updated to be a um, commercial entrance meeting the requirements of the State Highway Administration. Um, they have issued approval of that as well as the sidewalk, which was another one of their requirements. This is just a simplified review of the site. 
So this is all the paved area. The building would be here off to the west facing the road. These lines in the ground here you can see are underground pipes that will take any discharge from anywhere on the site to that stormwater facility. You can also see in this view the existing septic system that will be utilized as well as the existing well that will be utilized for this use. And another thing that was hard to see in the last plan is this little feature here. This is a, um, in order to put sprinkler system in for this site, which is required by fire protection requirements, they've put a uh, water tank here on the property that will just hold water in case it's needed and then they pump house to provide pressure for the sprinkler system. So that will be a little building there between the parking lot and the driveway entrance. Um, health department, fire protection, and, and so on have approved these plans as well. Of course, everybody's issued technical approvals. This is the landscaping plan. Like I mentioned previously in the September meeting, it was requested that I think previously the landscaping might have only gone from here to, to about here maybe along where the building is. It was requested that additional landscaping be provided and that has been provided. Now landscaping now stretches from the gated entrance all the way up to the north. We'll get to it in the next page, but this landscaping will actually join in with a forest conservation easement area. So you'll have the woods, then landscaping, then the gate, and then more landscaping down here on the south portion of the property, um, providing screening from the adjacent commercial use that's present there, um, as well as there's some residences back here, as well as the public park that additional landscaping will be provided in that area as well to provide screening. I'm gonna jump back to that. So like I just mentioned, there is a forest conservation easement area on the property. Actually, there'll be quite a bit of environmental resource protection easements on the property when this is all said and done. This forest conservation area here is existing woods and there's some honeycomb areas here here and here, and that honeycomb simplifies that they'll be planting new trees there as well as part of that conservation e or forest conservation easement. And then this entire region back here where we saw from the original um, orthographic views that is all wooded, most of those woods are remaining intact and will be collected and protected by a water, forested water resource management easement. So that serves to protect the stream as well as the trees in that area. Um, there's a, there's a fair bit of acreage there. I think it's 3.8 acres for the water resource protection easement area, which includes the trees, as well as an additional 1.2 acres of forest conservation easement only up along this northern boundary here. And I think that about covers it. These are the renderings of the building. Like I mentioned, this is what will be facing Route 30. Uh, this will be the view when you first come in the driveway and look to your left with the office building facing Route 30 and then the opposite views as well. So I would be happy to answer, or try to answer any questions anybody might have from the commission and of course the public as well. Thank you. I have a question. Um, the, the rainwater off the roof, is that also going into that storm pond? Yes, everything is handled through there. Um, I can't see quite the details. Perhaps um, Jeff might be able to provide details as to exactly where the storm, the downspouts go. Yeah, so, so the downspouts dis discharge right on top of the blacktop from, you know, from the roof onto the blacktop. But as Kirsten mentioned, <coughs> there are drainage swales surrounding the entire property um, in front of the building along Route 30 that conveys all the runoff into the submerged gravel wetland area as well as to the south um, that wraps around the, the southern part that drains everything to it. So it's not a direct connection from the roof to the storm drain system, but the entire parking lot and paved area gets to the submerged gravel wetland area. Because that submerged area, I mean, what kind of infiltration does it have? Because it's lined with plastic, so. Right, that's the, that's the, um, so the Maryland Department of Environment does not allow for infiltration from sites that are considered hot spots. And that's direct infiltration, like when the water runs off your driveway into your grass, right? 
So the way this is handled is all of that water runs into this, this swale system and is conveyed to this treatment basin, which is filled with quite a bit of depth of filter media of various aggregates that collects the pollutants there. And there's a maintenance process for all that too um, that the developer is responsible for, the owner is responsible for, and that our stormwater management office inspects on occasion for that filter media. So what happens is the water, instead of just infiltrating right off the driveway, goes into the swale system, goes into the filter media, pollutants are captured there, and it filters through to the bottom. Like if you have a, a water pitcher filter, it's just like that. So the wa dirty water goes in, it goes through this filter media, the filter media holds the contaminants, and the clean water comes out. There's a little spout down there, essentially, that then will discharge that clean water slowly back out into the wild world. Um, yeah, my, my only question would be, why wouldn't you keep the clean water clean coming off the roof? Why wouldn't you treat that separate mm. just so you have that much less running through the media? Interesting. I think that that's a, that is a good question. I think that at this point, the way this project is handling the stormwater, it, it does get treated. Yeah. That's a good question as to why, why further burden your system. Um, maybe a good way for a developer to, to handle the stormwater in the future, but this does meet the requirements that are imposed for what's being proposed here. But I, I see where you're coming from. It's a very good point. Okay. Any other comments? from Jeff or owner? No, I can answer any questions you might have, any further questions. I remember the site plan from the previous time you were here and appreciate you updating the site plan with the additional landscape because I, I do remember that being one of the, the things that we had expressed. Uh, the concerns was just making sure that we concealed that truck court, the cross dock nature of the building. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate you, 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 you amending it the way you did. Thank you. Yeah. Just um, uh, uh, no, I was going to open it for public comment, and then we can okay. have some more. So, any public comment on this? Okay. Please state your name and address. Good morning. My name is Randy Miller, and um, I'm a board member, officer, and volunteer for Charlotte's Quest Nature Center and town resident in Manchester, Maryland. Um, do you need my street address? or? Um, no. I'm speaking today as a community member out of concern of and in opposition to the project proposal made by Drill Tech Drilling and Shoring Inc. to build an industrial vehicle maintenance facility at their proposed location. My concern comes from occurrences which occurred shortly after the initial proposal meeting for their project, which occurred on September 20th of last year. Despite still being in the concept phase and pending approval, Drill Tech had, become, had begun working on this project by digging, moving, and grading the soil in order to place an office building without a permit at 3411 Hanover Pike. These actions resulted in two separate stop work orders. There was also concern raised involving the time that it took Drill Tech to take required measures to prevent erosion in relation to the unauthorized work working with so the soil that had taken place. Please consider these occurrences in conjunction with the fact that Drill Tech's site is uphill from and directly adjacent to Pine Valley Park, which is the location of wells that provide drinking water to Manchester and Baltimore County. The proposed Drill Tech site overlaps with streams and wetlands that connect to these water supplies and is also directly adjacent to wildlife conservation habitats. Given that Drill Tech, and so early on, began to disregard policies and procedures, it would appear locally negligent to approve this project if the environment and human health are considered. That is all. Thank you. Any buddy? Okay, come up. Yeah, my name is George Hutman. Uh, a degree in environmental planning. That's made a governor, Ehrlich, and football team made at Gilman in Baltimore. Uh, just, just a brief comments. I cannot think of a worse site selection for this industrial site than this. Route 30 in the Manchester area has some of the worst traffic congestion in the county with no hope of a bypass and a failing intersection just south with Route 27. 
Northbound traffic accelerates downhill from Manchester, increasing the risk of collision with large slow moving trucks entering and leaving drill tech. It is not a flat site, it is sloped down to the Trout Unlimited Stream wetlands and town wells and borders the town nature park. A slope site for industrial use is unusual. So the questions we have are several, but one is what type of vehicles, like how large will the vehicles be that are attempting to pull onto Hanover Pike? How much water use will there be from that single old well? The town water supply is limited, and sooner or later we are going to have another drought. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Tim Fieser, lifelong Carroll County resident, currently live in Manchester, about a mile as the crow flies in this site. I've also been an officer in the Patapsco Valley Chapter of Trout Unlimited for about the past 35 years, and our mission is protecting the waterways of Central Maryland. And we are no stranger to the folks of uh, the Water Resources Departments of Carroll County and, and of the state uh, DNR and, and um, MDE. That a facility like this is even proposed or, or considered for a site like this, I mean, it's almost the poster child of what should not occur on a site like this in a sensitive area. Um, if down the hill, as, as has been mentioned, is a, a stream, and that stream is a tributary of the south branch of the Gunpowder Falls, which is identified by the state of Maryland as a tier three usage uh, stream with an existing population of native brook trout, which doesn't mean a lot to a lot of people, but it, it does to us. Um, and brook trout are an indicator species. If brook trout can live in a stream, water quality is good. If brook trout vanish from an existing habitat, something has happened and the water quality is, uh, is suffering. We've had discussions, when I say we, Patapsco Valley Trout and them, but have had discussions with the county and with the state over this particular project and also other projects that kind of fit this same mold across the state. Uh, DNR and MDE are, are actually currently looking at the, the, the kinds of stormwater management systems that are proposed here, feeling that there may be something better. Um, and, and, and we know, I know, commercial industrial development is such an asset to the county. I used to work in this building. I know what the ratio of industrial to residential, Carroll County is way out of balance. We need you know, the tax base for sure. But we really need to look at, is this the right place you know, for this kind of, a, of business? Um, at the very least, we would like to see the county, uh, Maryland DNR, MDE, go back to the drawing board and look at this particular site and see if there is not a better, more efficient way to handle you know, the stormwater. Um, not saying these folks can't develop on this property, but maybe there's just a better way that they can do what they want to do, the environment can be better protected. So thank you for listening. Thank you. If I could speak to that final point, um, we received the email that Trout Unlimited had sent that was sent to the Planning Commission, um, and these were the, the topics that were discussed there. Um, so it's my understanding that to that final point about going back to the drawing board, talking about other options for a site like this, or this site in particular, um, it's my understanding that when, when this site is submitted through the state for a notice of intent, and that's something associated with the grading process, okay? So that's required for any disturbance um, over, I believe, 30,000 square feet. It's a, a significant amount of disturbance on the land, which this property definitely achieves that, so the notice of intent is required to be submitted to the state. The state will then look at that project at that time, specifically that project and what's being proposed there, and perform a review at that time. Um, so it's my understanding that that is something that this particular concern with regarding the tier two and tier three water reviews, that's also handled specifically by the state at that time. 
Um, if something were to happen through that review process that changes the site layout to the point where, well, the layout's changed, that might trigger a need for this plan to come back through the review process with the county. It would have to be discussed and determined at that time how that will be handled internally here. But again, if the state finds that these, that if this plan was approved today or if it was approved in the future, or if any plan's approved in the future that goes through that notice of intent process, they would review it then. If there's tier two, tier three waters, they review it regarding that and would be able to say, this isn't gonna work, we can't approve it, and it gets kicked back into our process. So if again, if this was to be approved today and the state were to find fault with it and require redesign, they would make that decision through their review process and it would come back to us. They won't issue approval for it to be built until that notice of intent is approved and that notice of intent can't be approved until the state approves it. And if they identify these issues, it comes back to us. Okay, mm -hmm. makes sense. Any, okay, yes sir. Tom Smith, resident of Manchester. Uh, I live within 200 yards of where this site is. There's numerous houses closer than I am. The traffic problem is terrible in the morning and evening both uh, in that whole area. This morning prior to 8.30, it took me about five minutes to get out of the driveway and that was only because somebody stopped and let me out. Traffic was backed up out of sight down the hill as it is every morning. And uh, it's, it's just a terrible place to have more truck traffic in that area. There's already one truck site that's there. It started out as a bus site 50 some years ago and upgraded now to truck site uh, depot. And when they go in and out of there, no matter what time of day or night it is, it's always a problem. So uh, adding more, adding more uh, traffic to it, with especially trucks, is a, is a problem issue. And my understanding is Drill Tech contacted the town of Manchester when it originally started to uh, consider that site was trying to uh, get using town water and town sewer and it was denied as the town didn't want to have anything to do with it uh, and now they'd want to tap into the same water aquifers uh, drawn from the same drawn from the same water that was mentioned that uh, <coughs> numerous years there's been droughts and uh, everyone in Manchester has been limited to the amount of water usage uh, and cutbacks so by putting something in like this is to me it's going to create even more problem with what good it's going to do thank you thank you for your comments um i may have missed it maybe it wasn't in there but the um 30 is a state road correct right so they have already seen this plan yes yeah, state highway administration has approved the the road construction plans with the entrance and the sidewalk and the grading within the state right away okay was there any d cell or xl lane um no there is there is the the widening of the entrance um in conjunction with the um existing shoulder lane that's there now to turn in I said the only other question I would well one of the other questions I would have is uh, you know I think we talked about it before when you came in front of us how many gallons of water a day and do you have to have a permit with MDE for your water usage I'm sure it's not more than 10,000 gallons a day but. Um, I, I don't know Jason unless you know but it they're on a private well system um, it is it is only the bathrooms that are used inside for the offices and maybe some hand washing inside the maintenance office building. So it's not a lot of usage. Um, their septic system is designed for the minimum use 400 gallons per day, um, which is more than adequate for the, the use of, of the building. But again, that's the minimum septic use that they have. How about do you have a wash bay to wash it? any of the equipment I'm, whenever you work on anything you normally have to wash it so how's that going to be handled um jason do you know if there's a wash bay proposed in there there is i i do know that there are floor drains in there because of equipment coming through um, yeah, the building itself 
Um, there is floor drains in there, but they are drained into a oil grid separator outside the building, which then is connected to the um, underground storm drain system, which filters in through the stormwater facility. And I, if I could, I recall in discussion we had in a meeting recently, um, it was noted in the Planning Commission report that the county and the developer and um, the engineer and the town of Manchester met to address the town's concerns um, regarding the well and the, and, and the stormwater, essentially, the stream and so on. Um, and during that meeting, uh, Jason wasn't there, but Bob was there. And Bob had explained when the town asked that question that um, the vehicles they're bringing in at the jobs, they, they're at job sites working and they get covered in mud because that's what happens when you're digging at a job site. Before they can load those vehicles either onto a trailer or get it out into the road, there's transportation requirements to clean them first so you don't have rocks and debris coming off of them. Um, so it was explained to us that all washing of debris like that will be occurring off-site prior to the vehicle even heading to this property. Um, I don't know if they're going to have a hose for you know incidental things you might have on the property, but that was our understanding is that all of the major washing, mud and so on off these vehicles would occur off site. Michael, anything? So, well, is there uh, lots of concern about water runoff, pollution, the streams, the environment? I hear that. And, and uh, is there a way that we can add to the recommendation that uh, you know, Kirsten mentioned that the state will go through that process of, of um, you know, the Department of Environment will review and may possibly update because technology is changing all the time. Is there a way to add to the recommendations that this, you know, it's, this would be okay as long as the state standards are met? Well, like I mentioned, the state's the one who has to approve that notice of intent. And they're not going to approve it unless their requirements are met. And if the requirements aren't met and the site gets redesigned, we end up having to discuss with the developer how, how that process would be handled. And if they pursue a, a site plan amendment, obviously, we'll, we'll come before the commission again for approval or, or the chair. Okay. So or it's, kind, that it's kind of built it's in. Built in. Yeah, any, yeah. Any, any grading project that disturbs more than an acre um, not only has to go through the local Tim Hare grading permitting, right. Right. Um, but it also needs a notice of intent, which is issued by the Maryland Department of Environment. Tim Hare will not lo issue his local grading permit until he receives the approval from MDE. Okay. Okay. Good. And I would say that there's always going to be better technology. So, I mean, you can't say oh there's something going to come down the road there's always going to be something coming down the road so yeah. current best available technology yeah. i agree pete anything nothing nothing else even i mean uh, that hill as it is i mean you have the sheets and then it goes down into that other shopping center and then there's already it looks like a bus place big rig there's, place that's yep. on top of the hill anyway so i mean i kind of look at it that potentially you know the stuff that they're putting in if anything it's going to help try to get some of that stuff because it all it, it, it's all running down that hill one way or another so this may potentially help you know clean that whole hill up to begin to be honest with you so commissioner any comments oh, none today thank you okay all right um then hearing no other comments, uh, does somebody want to make a recommendation? Read it off of here. Um, well, yeah, you don't need to read it all. Just yeah, I would just say I will make the recommendation to approve with the pursuit of Chapter 155. Staff recommends approval of the site development plan subject to the six. list of uh, six. Is it just six? It is. Yeah. Yep. The six uh, conditions. A second. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 
any opposed. Okay. Then good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time today. Um, number 14 is recess. Um, a short 10 minutes, 5 minutes? 5. Yeah. 5. 8 wants to get out. We all want to get Let's do this. Uh,
back in session and moving forward with the water and sewer triennial, triennial update. Um, Price. Good no. morning. I believe it's still morning. Yes, it is. So this is uh, a brief. Came, I briefed this uh, the commission about a month and a half, two months ago. This is the actual certification for the county portions of the triennial update, which are the Freedom Service Areas for Water and Sewer, and the Hampstead Service Area for Sewer. So again, why are we? updating the, the plan well first is a state mandate every three years to review and update the plan for all service areas uh, within the county which includes all municipalities which as a service we include those in the trilineal update um, again like i said we update this for all this document for all county owned systems in addition to all the municipalities and also in order for a project to move forward a development project it needs to be within the master water and sewer master plan if it's gonna be served by public water and public sewer. So if it's not shown on the master plan, um, if it's in any category besides existing priority or future, then those projects will not be able to move forward on public water and sewer. So what has changed? A couple of things, nothing major. Uh, the biggest change would be the 2019 amendment to the Carroll County Master Plan, uh, which is in 2014. And that was uh, pretty much working on the boundaries of all the maps because some of the growth areas did contract. So we, those areas we worked on. And, which, and then, of course, the other big portion is the city of Westminster. Their pilot study for the water use facility has completed. So you may remember in the okay, we're in spring, the fall amendment of the, actually, I'm sorry, maybe the 20, no, it was the fall amendment, we had a split allocation for the city of Westminster, 500,000 gallons in priority and 500,000 gallons in future. That was to show this 1 million uh, gallon per day capacity that this water reuse, reuse program was looking to do. That was approved. However, in the meantime, between that approval and that submission, that approval and this, the city has moved far enough ahead. They are able to look at and bring that total 1 million gallons into the priority service area for water. So that's the, the one big issue, not issue, I'm sorry, one big change for the city of Westminster is now realizing that additional 1 million capacity in the priority service area for water. And then, of course, all the amendments to the 2019 Water and Sewer Master Plan are incorporated. So anything that happened after the approval date in July of 2019 are now incorporated as amendments. Uh, some of those are map amendments. Some of those are text amendments. Uh, some of those are just table amendments. All those are included in, in this actual section. In this. So what have I done and what has the county done? We had meetings with all the providers, all municipalities. Um, some of them were fairly in-depth, and those uh, they were ongoing. Initially, we met one-on-one -on -one and you know, provided them their, their original chapters for the 2017-2019 master plan, as well as the most recent maps for, each, for them to look at, review to see if anything has changed when it comes to uh, allocation or not alloc but uh, maps that are for areas that are in now that may have been in priority but now have been built upon need to be existing pipe uh, pipe diameters that type of thing and then of course when it comes to the flows and usage when it, for you know, flows for sewer and then pumpage for the wells on that aspect of what their most recent numbers are and some of those range anywhere from 20 it's usually a three-year average so it's 2020 to 23 or 19 to 22, depending on when they provided their, their final stoppage. Um, and then again, they also list any capacity enhancing projects. So these are projects that could potentially enhance the capacity of a plant. Um, again, going back for the city of Westminster, their water reuse project is on there as a capacity enhancement project of 1 million gallons. 
Um, there are other projects that are listed, but a lot of those do not have capacity enhancement. They may be relining of pipes, so you get stop leakage, or in the case of inflow and infiltration of stormwater getting into and treating stormwater versus actually getting getting to the uh, the people. And then properties in long range are not counted towards the estimated demands. You may see them on the maps and it's if it's the water map, it's uh, blue hatched. If it's the sewer map, it's green hatched. But however, when it comes to the demands to the system, those 10 year, 10 plus years, those are not allocated or not estimated in those maps or on those tables, I'm sorry, for demand. So where are we now? The, all the town planning commissions, city planning commissions, have reviewed this. I have gone in front of them and asked for their consistency with their most recent master plans. And we have received those certifications of consistency with the master plans for all municipalities. The one exception is Mount Airy. We are gonna go in front of them in June. Um, however, I've been working with their planning department as well as their town engineer. And we have received all the information, inputted it, have input it into our master document and then have sent it back to them just for a final review to make sure everything is is good. So all the information that that I receive when it comes to the chapters for water and sewer is all provided by the providers themselves, the municipalities. So when you see flow data, if you see any when it comes to any of the numbers, those come from those providers themselves. The only, the only time that we make estimates is in table 15 which is the water projection table and table 32 which is the sewer projection table <coughs> when it comes to priority and future that is where we utilize the county's buildable land inventory and the state's mde's matrix for 250 gallons for residential demand per unit and then when it comes to water and when it comes to commercial industrial we utilize 800 gallons for industrial and 700 gallons for commercial usable land. Those numbers, again, those are estimates. So I multiply if there's ends up being a, you know, 100 units in priority, multiply it by 250, you have 2,500 gallons of what the potential demand is gonna be. Obviously, with that being said, we realize the existing number, that is what we're hoping to be is our reset, knowing that it's even though it's not a true actual of what is being billed, it is more precise than the estimate. So if you divide that number by the number of potential units, it should be hopefully less than 250. I mean, yes, could it be above that? It could, it is residential. But typically we've come to find that the actual usage is less. So that's sort of where the numbers are, that's the only place the numbers are not provided by the municipalities. This map is just the overall planned water service areas for the entire county. Um, you have, you know, the water's on the left and you have the sewer on the right. So here's the more in depth, here's the most recent, here's the draft map we have for the freedom service areas. And I sent out in uh, your packets a map that was a little bit bigger. Hopefully you're able, to look, you're able to see that and read it in a PDF form and scroll in and zoom in to certain areas. Um, as you can see, and when it comes to the water service area, there's a little areas of long range, but the majority of the service area is either existing, future or priority for water. When it comes to the sewer side, there are a little bit more bigger areas of, of long range, um, mostly in areas that, are, that were constructed prior to when the system went into place or after the system went into place. Um, well, they were built before, they were constructed in, prior to when the system was, was done. And then, so those are usually larger neighborhoods that were built in the you know, 50s, 60s, and 70s, uh, give or take. So a lot of these you'll see a you know, majority of it is in the existing service area for sewer. Uh, the town of Sykesville is included in our actual freedom service area for both water and sewer. Um, so you'll see 
when the water wise i believe majority of the town is within the existing service area with the exception of I believe two or three small parcels and then on the sewer side same thing um, they utilize our system and again this is also for the town of hampstead so the, this town has already seen both the water and sewer side even though the the county is the provider for sewer as you know the town as development occurs he also wanted to see just to make sure they're in line with with development of what's going on even though we do we provide it they're the ones that oversee all the development so the the one big change here would be um just updating areas that would have been maybe in priority prior and now because they've been built upon we make them existing so that is something i have done if a development uh, this, i'm going to use me uh, meets crossing up in tawny town at the previous at the previous one the meets crossing maybe had a very little bit of existing service then as we've got when i've talked with the town with the city now it is all existing because their permits have been totally pulled and they in the city's eyes they'll be connecting relatively soon so we made that area totally existing now so a lot of that is something that has been in the on the books instead of doing small little lots every so often in a larger overall subdivision if the area has been complete or almost complete because all the permits to build have been pulled we bring that into the existing service area so as you may see you know the the biggest change here was the, and during the amendment the northern part of the ida property the northern uh, industrial se uh, section we brought in the very top portions of that into the priority service area to better allow this the county and the town to to you know send that show that as an area is, is ready to be built that all that from all that demand is there and then these are this is sort of this is how the plan is is consistent with the carroll county master plan um, again we're we did definitely talk with all of the providers all the municipalities all the major players as well as talks back and forth with mde mde has a copy draft copy of all of this and they're reviewing right now um so we're talking you know always in talks with each of the providers each the make sure our information we're receiving is accurate and what they're providing is also accurate on their end um, again we're also looking to help hopefully look at protecting and enhancing the water quality of the county so in essence using as part of the wre which i know the the section that's within this this plan is still the one that was adopted in 2010 they're in the process of updating that however it's not in a full it's not in an air a portion yet where we wanted wanted to insert it in this because it's not been adopted and approved so we're still utilizing a lot of the information from 2010 however that information is still very viable today so we're making sure that the areas that are within the growth area those are the places that you do want to have water and sewer service um, again to the extent feasible provide you know adequate and appropriate community investment uh, projects to whether it's you know extend service or in some cases it's to work on areas that have had issues like the one big like in shiloh up in uh, hampstead the shiloh pump station that is in, is i believe in the cip to get a refurbishment because they've had issues with that plant trying to to get what need is needed pumped so they're looking to to refurbish that um, so a lot of it is most of the cip money is going towards whether it's within the county or the towns of leakage issues where you realign it so you, to reduce leakage or when it comes to i and i things not getting into the system or replacing lines altogether because they've been in the ground for 70 80 sometimes 90 years and i think some of those cases i believe new windsor may be one of those where the, some of their lines are relatively if not the original they're not far off from being the original lines and uh, you know looking at protecting the mineral resources so around new windsor looking at making sure everything is 
is concise and that the areas that are being developed do not have any undue effect on the mineral resources that may be there. Um, and then facilitate a development pattern. Again, trying to facilitate and develop within the growth areas because those are the areas that have the water and sewer infrastructure, uh, whether it's existing or in some cases planned. And if it's planned, is typically on the burden of the developer to extend the, the infrastructure to those developments. And then, you know, pursue policies that facilitate development in appropriate areas. That's sort of, this is looking at, you know, making sure that there is water and sewer for the areas that need to be, that are looking to be developed um, in that aspect of things. So this is the, the water demands table um, for the overall that's been updated. And you have, for this one, you'll just have uh, the Freedom Sightsville area. So right now we're looking at a, you know, we have a expected capacity or right now existing capacity of, you know, 4.4 million gallons. And we only have a demand at this point in time that's pretty much everything that was, has been pumped of just a little over 2 million gallons. And there is, there are projects to get the plant capacity up to 7 million gallons with a potential demand in year 10 of my eyesight has gotten bad. 3.091, I believe. That's what that one says. And then here is the sewer section. So Hampstead, uh, they have in some areas. So their their big one is when it comes to the priority in future. Um, because priority does take into account Yes, it does take into account areas that are that could be potentially developed. There is one large subdivision that potentially could be developed in the ha in Hampstead, which is uh, Hampstead Overlook, which is in the city's or the, the town's review process and has been in the re review process for a while now. Um, so that number and is for 255 total total units. Some of those being townhomes, but also the majority of it being single family homes. So that number definitely shows and it it shows a, a big, big increase. However, is in the priority of service area, but again, not really knowing when they're going to connect. That number is a placeholder per se, that demands a placeholder. And just so you, just also to sort of to know when I compared the present year for this, for the 2023 to the present year numbers we had in 2017, 2019, the demands, all the demands went down. So I think that, at least for me, that it appears to be showing that things are, you know, new low flow technology, the, the, you know, especially some of these numbers, you have to you remember, we were pulling these numbers from when a lot of people, when COVID, when everybody was in lockdown, so usage, presumably could have been higher. However, when it came to the pumpage data and the well and the flow data, the numbers were less. Um, so there was less usage overall. So again, I think I'm taking that into account as potentially people are updating their, their systems, whether it's sinks, toilets, whatever it may be, to not utilize as much with the new lower flow technology. Now, is that a guarantee or is that set in stone? No, it's not, but it's a, it's what I'm, I perceive, especially it was not just one or two, it was everybody across the board had less usage. Now, looking at the Freedom Sightsville area, we have, you know, the total capacity at the plant is 3.5 million gallons. And in the future, in future planning, when we include everything, we're showing just a little over 3.2 million gallons of total demand. So the Freedom Sykesville area is a unique area uh, is because the demand the demand is broken down between three different players. You have the, the state, which has a, a set amount. Uh, then you have the war field, which is included in what the county perceives as their demand. We don't perceive it, I'm sorry, as, as part of our demand. And then you have the left, whatever's left over is the county demand. So. It's all in there. We, unfortunately, we don't know what the state uses, how much they use. Um, 
in essence where when it comes to the numbers we don't have that that general data um, however it's perceived that you know <coughs> their actual usage is they have you know a set aside demand of my understanding all the information i've had and seen over the years minus the warfield process project is roughly 758,000 gallons a day is what the state has their allocation for the springfield hospital complex is what we consider it as but that includes a lot of different properties in that area of, of the freedom area and then the warfield complex has 142,000 gallons a day which a lot of that has has been built um, i think fortunately i don't believe their actual usage is anywhere near that, which is a good thing. However, that is set aside just for the Warfield complex, and the county is not able to utilize any of that that uh, demand for our for us. So here's sort of where we are, depending on all the steps on depending on how today turns out with the, the certification. Is on May 25th next week. Um, my plan is to brief the board of county commissioners and request a public hearing. If that goes well, then the public hearing will be set for the June the 16th. Excuse me, first it would have to be the 15th because the 16th is a Friday. Really? Yes. Thank you. Just want to make sure I'm aware. Okay. I thought everybody wanted to work on a Friday. All right, so that would be June the 15th. Thank you. Um, so June the 15th would be the, the public hearing, and we will have, uh, it will be duly advertised in the Carroll County, Carroll County Times. Will be, it will be on the website, so it, the information will get out to to everyone to for the public hearing um, should the you know the public hearing go well then the adoption we're looking for on June the 29th it'll be adoption with a resolution to uh, for the adopted water and sewer master plan to the state of Maryland for their final approval and that's where the Ford to MDE comes into play um, this plan does not go into effect until MDE gives their final approval so that could be if we do say forward it at the beginning of July if it takes them three or four months anything that comes in will fall under the existing plan which is the 2017 plan or 2019 depending on how you want to uh, look at it it was 2017 when it started however uh, circumstances push it off to 2019 with trying to work with other other things and getting all the number <coughs> data we needed so in the meantime, the 2017-19 plan is the plan that stays and moves forward. Um, once this plan does get adopted by the state, whenever that may be, it now becomes the, the main, the overriding document and supersedes the 2017 plan. And we move forward from there with biannual updates if they are needed for amendments. And then you know, probably roughly two and a half, year and a half, two years from now, start this process all over again to get ready for the 26 27 water and sewer master plan update Oops, sorry so that is the pretty much all of what i have um as you'll see there's a recommended there's a recommended motion on the screen um i'm sure you know if the commission has any questions i'll be happy to answer that if there's any questions uh in the public i'll be happy to answer those as the best i can and go from there thank you thank you um any questions no. Yeah. Yeah. A couple. Tony Town has been uh, in the news right. before us about their water issues and their leakage and their infrastructure. Can you give a little update about where they are? Because I noticed on some of the, uh, uh, I guess, the water part and the sewer part. The sewer looks like there's, uh, you know, projecting increase there, but the water. Uh, wasn't so much. Um, right. Is, are they working on their problem? Are they? They are. The um, they system. Correct. Yes, sir. They are working on that. They are taking. Um, I think one of the areas they may have just completed is the Roberts Mill area. Of it. They, I'm not sure what the length is, but they have replaced or lined those pipes. Uh, lining lining pipes is is more cost effective. Um, because you're not ripping, you can get started at one end and, and it pushes the lining through, and then the, and then it, it in essence it like a, it, it expands, and then hopefully the leakage or on other side infiltration uh, stops. So yes, Tawny Town is working on both 
leakage when it comes to loss of water and infiltration when it comes to groundwater getting into their, their sewer system. It's a long process and it's one of those as my understanding talking with the utility, you're never going to completely stop anything. As in, you're never gonna get it 100% non-leaking or non-infiltrating uh, because as soon as you fix something here, at some point in time, something down on the other end or something's gonna happen. So the recoup rate can occur and these are projects that do not add capacity at all. However, they are able to recoup capacity. So instead of, let's say, if their number, when it comes to their, their, their total demand is, let's say, is 450,000 gallons, let's say 100,000 of that could be infiltration or leakage. So if they're able to fix those leaks and get it down to 50, now they're able to utilize 50,000 gallons. They recoup that 50,000 that can now go to other, other you know, users versus that's just leaking out of the pipes and nobody's actually getting any water. Same thing with sewer. They're able to recoup that and utilize that hopefully for users and not treating rainwater. Right. But yes, most every single jurisdiction is, in the, is working on leakage or I&I &I for sewer. Yeah, there's there are long going ongoing projects that I think is one of those. If you try to list every single one of them, it would, the document would be so long. However, the they are listed on here because obviously if they want to get money for it for the state or if they're asking for permits, then the state will say, is that one of the the projects on here? There are some areas that when it comes to like, is a a catch-all is the wrong word, but there may be under priority projects is maintenance of the system, of the lines, or something specific where I've talked with the state and they've even called me about certain things. And I said, this is what it states. And like, that's our understanding is, okay, they're maintaining, so we're fine with how this is moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, so, Is there a targeted uh, number for leakage percentage, that you know, goal that everybody's trying to achieve or some kind of range or? It's my understanding is it's you're always going. I think when especially when it comes to I and I, I believe you're always it, the industry understanding and the industry average is around thirty percent is going to be what you're always going to have mm -hmm. for I and I for for leakage. It could be maybe around the same the thirty percent give or take. But I think again, depending on the pipe, you know, old terracotta pipe as it you know it's that. The newer pipe is and that kind of thing. It's just how it, it's the nature. that everybody when they work on it, they realize they're going to have you know, 25, 30 percent, give or take, of this. They're not. That's not going to get to a user. Okay. Any other questions? Right. For somewhere in the back of my mind, I thought Springfield had their own water and treatment facility there on site they do not they do that is they do not they have their own um i mean there are laundry, walls right. on that particular site uh -huh. but the those walls are not production walls for the springfield hospital complex when you when you drive through there i could have sworn there was a treatment facility it looks like one you are there at one point tom you're correct there was a treatment facility <laughs> It, it is not working, but I looked at the most recent Google Street View. If it's working, I'd be scared. <laughs> all the windows are broken out. There's vegetation all over it. So <laughs> yeah. there's, yeah. yes, I think maybe, yes, at one point in time, I have no clue when, there, there was a plant on site. However, the building's there, but when it comes to treatment aspect, it is not in use. Okay. Everything goes through Maryland Environmental Services treatment facility. Can you put the motion <laughs> back up? One more time. No. The motion back up uh, yes, for I, us to cheat. You want? Yeah, I don't know if anybody, if it's a public. We're, we're going to get there. Yes. Yeah, I'm going the wrong way. I'm sorry. Yeah, we have public comment after both. Um, or do you want to take it separate? Uh, uh, Madam Chair, it's up to you. If you want to do public comment now for this item, that's totally fine. Okay. <laughs> we'll take your comment if you want to step up and give your name. So, 
my name is Joanne Grundy, and I'd like to comment on the water and sewer plan with a focus on the freedom area in regards to sewer. So I think everybody up here probably knows sewer is the biggest limiting factor to growth in the largest unincorporated designated growth area, which is freedom. But it should not be compared to other unincorporated areas without public sewer available, especially because the large portion of this area is a priority funding area. Previously, the county connected older homes on small lots in the Freedom area as infill development occurred, but they stopped this about 20 years ago. Infill development has made public sewer available on small lots on septic that were originally planned for future connection. The county should allocate this limited infrastructure to existing development before future development. There are currently no plans or money set aside to expand the sewage treatment plant once the 85% capacity trigger is reached. The draft plan's long-term recommendations, the 10 plus years, include expanding the plant to accommodate homes on small lots, which leaves the burden of failing septic systems and well contamination on individual property owners for the foreseeable future. This is not sound planning, and it's not in the interest of the county, the community, or the environment. Starting on page 101 of the plan are problem areas, and also table 17F and table 27B of the draft plan don't include problem areas documented in previous water and sewer plans in the Freedom area. This includes Merriman Heights, Carroll Dale, Carroll Square, Winchester Hills, and Emerald Valley. I have um, from my Public Information Act requests with Price and Linda, I have copies of the 85 and the 77 plans showing those areas as having sewer problems. The Gaither area is only included on table 17F. This area is still listed as understudy, and it has been for over 10 years, why the county continues to allocate sewer to undeveloped parcels. Some areas are known, have known septic issues, were connected to public water due to contamination of private wells, but the septic systems remain in use. Many residents still rely on private wells for safe drinking water, and many are in areas where septic systems and problems are documented. In order for the plan to properly, properly illustrate public health and environmental concerns, those tables 17F and 27B should be updated to reflect all known areas that have had septic problems and remain on septic systems for disposal. The 2021 county survey targeting owners of small lot residential septic systems indicated over 30% were having septic issues, over 50% had original systems, and over 70% were interested in connecting to sewer. Septic systems are expected to last 20 to 30 years under normal conditions. Newer systems in the Freedom Area are experiencing failures due to rising groundwater levels after storm events. The largest reallocation of public sewer from small lots on septic was in tw around 2016. Dan Hoff served on the Planning and Zoning Commission at this time and made a comment who, why, why wouldn't someone want, why would someone want to pay a connection fee for public sewer when they could replace their failing leach field for $5,000? I can tell you from personal experience and experience from talking to several landowners, it's closer to $40,000 and up with grant funding on a small lot by today's standards. 20% uh, the reserve for emergency connection is meaningless to individual landowners on small lots. Connecting one property at a time is expensive, complicated, and time consuming. And unless public sewer has already been brought to the neighborhood, many are denied access. The Planning Department, Planning and Zoning Commission, and the Board of County Commissioners can and should do better. Your public servants and decisions made should reflect your best efforts to assist the communities throughout the county that cannot do it on their own. I happen to work at the US Army Corps of Engineers and one of my current projects is helping a town in Pennsylvania connect 600 homes to public sewer now that it has finally reached their back door. I just wanna remark Mr. Price, or Mr. Wagoneer, I'm sorry, said um, he mentioned that within growth areas, water and sewer should be available. It is not to over 2,000 homes in the Freedom Area. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Does anybody wish to have these copies?
copies of the problem areas that are not in the water and sewer triennial update. There are six of them. Anybody interested? Um, yeah, I'd, I'd take a copy. Sure. Thank you. And if, if you would like, if Mr. Wagoner is willing, I can show you those neighborhoods on the map. I think we um, are familiar with some of them. Okay. Um, any other public comment? Okay. Hi, my name is Kristen Morinelli. I'm an environmental engineer, and I'd like to comment on the public sewer system in the Freedom Area. There are many homes in the area that are on septic systems, which are expected to last 20 to 30 years, but many people don't realize they have an issue until they try to sell their home or until there's a drastic failure. Many homes in the area have septic systems that are beyond the expected lifespan, so their systems may be failing and they don't realize it. Aging homes on lots two acres or smaller, which applies to most of us, could, have, could face additional burdens when their systems fail. Because of newer regulations since their original systems were installed, they could face estimates of at least $40,000 to replace their septic systems instead of the expected five dollars to $10,000 for a standard system. People don't have this kind of money available to replace a septic system, and if a, if a system fails, it's often an emergency and must be taken care of immediately. Systems are failing not only due to the age of the systems, but also due to the high water table encountered in the Freedom Area. I've spoken to several people in the area who have had failed septic systems. Um, they wanted to come and speak today. One man couldn't come because he works during the day. A woman couldn't come because she had child care obligations. But they did say I could relay their stories. Um, to keep it short, uh, they live in the Freedom area on lots that require upgraded, unaffordable systems. A man told me his system failed because of the high water table, and he's now in the process of receiving these high cost estimates. Um, He's worried about his property values and the potential of having to pay for another system in 30 years when the system he has to install now fails. Uh, one woman told me her septic system backed up into their basement. They had it repaired and it happened again. They applied for a grant, but because of the grant system, they had to wait for a few months before they could even apply. Um, they had to move out of their home for several months until they could actually get the grant payment and replace their septic system. Um, I know if that happened to, my, to me, I wouldn't have the option of moving in with family in the area. She told me her neighbor's system also failed and they had to install an expensive system. Yet another neighbor's system failed years ago, but they don't have the money to replace their septic system, so they have ignored the issue. Uh, the woman I spoke to told me there's human excrement in the water flowing through the culvert by her house. Failing septic systems have the potential to impact the area's groundwater as well. The woman I previously mentioned buys bottled water for her family to drink. I wouldn't want to drink groundwater from an area with septic system contamination, but I'm afraid that's exactly what we'll be dealing with in the future if public sewer isn't available. I've worked on remediation projects for homes with contaminated groundwater, and their property values plummet. The people often have nothing of value to show for their homes. Public sewer capacity needs to be reserved for areas that will need it in the near future. Waiting until there's an emergency doesn't allow people the ability to connect. The county has all the permits showing the ages and types of septic systems currently in use. The county should put this information on a map and determine the communities that are expected to have these expensive septic replacements and prioritize connecting them to public sewer to assist the existing residents and to protect our community's groundwater. We've heard from the planning department that the extension of public sewer to lots smaller than one acre would be inefficient, an inefficient use for the public sewer because it is a limited service. Um, yet that's exactly what's being planned in some parts of the Freedom Area. The county has a responsibility to the existing residents to provide the infrastructure necessary to ensure basic health and environmental safeguards for its citizens. It's short-sighted to not extend the public sewer system to these aging homes with older septic systems. These systems will fail and the homeowners could face exorbitant, unaffordable bills to replace their septic systems. As already discussed, some may not know their system is having an issue, and some who can't afford this may try to avoid the issue altogether, creating a health risk for the community. Groundwater could be contaminated, necessitating homeowners to not only replace a system, but their neighbors to also drill new wells and pay for that out of their own pocket. The county should allocate this limited infrastructure to existing communities before extending it to new developments, leaving individual homeowners to bear this burden 
when the county could help its citizens avoid this issue is not good planning for the interest of the community or the environment. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, I can say on a personal note, I certainly sympathize with you. Um, I live in Gamber and we are way outside of any priority and had to replace our system a couple years ago. So um, it is unfortunate, but it is something that um, ends up being a necessity. So with that, um, any other comments, gentlemen? I would just ask, why, why was it taken out at some point along the way? Why was what taken out? Why, why, why were these developments taken out of possible future connections? connections? Honestly, because when we were reevaluating the Freedom Area, these we have no plans in the past and so far moving to the future to extend lines to about 1,200 homes that we did identify that were on a half acre or less in the heart of the Freedom Area. So since there were no plans to extend any services whatsoever um, into those communities, and we are not aware of any in, um, issues from the health departments who we get our information from about failing septic systems. The decision was to move them from priority existing today to a longer range category, so for future connection. Any other comments? And just to clarify, that was done and approved in the formerly adopted Triennial update. So nothing that's happening with this plan is changing that. Everything is staying the same. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, so we have before us. Um, well, I, I, I'm, I'm going to stay on this topic for one second, Linda. Mm -hmm. And um, I know you've met with you and staff have met with the FTCA down there, and um, you know they're some people down there who are really involved with this issue and I know you know that and um, they're not simply um, people who are, are I think are prone to be chicken little you know the sky's falling they're good at what they do and they specialize in this business and so you know when we have people who are civil engineers and Army Corps of Engineers and you know, you know environmental engineers saying wait a minute, this is happening in the area, and we sit up here and, and hear county staff say, well, this, this is an unhealth issue. T to me, okay, so let's assume that it's not a health issue. I, I think we can talk about there have been instances where there has been a health issue. I think, I think what we have here is a triennial update that we just keep punting this ball down the road, and, and sooner or later, you know, they're going to be, I, I don't think it's going to be 1,200 homes that have to be connected in a 24-month in a period. But I, I think we're going, what we're going to see is a problem here that's not geometric, where we have one or two homes that need to be connected. It's not going to be arithmetic, where there's two here, four there, five there. It's going to be a geometric problem, where all of a sudden it's this mushroom. And so... Um, I'd like for us to get in front of that problem and not behind it. And so I'll just say, you know, again, I think this is a problem that the community has voiced their concerns over. Uh, we did a survey and people expressed, I think we were all surprised that 70% of the people said, yeah, I'd, I'd sign up for that. Um, and so, uh, you know, I would encourage us to, to kind of, at some point we're gonna need to fund a plan without funding is hope, and that's not a good thing. At some point, we're going to need to kind of reassess, I think, and say, at some point, we do need to be extending sewer to some of these older homes because they're on smaller lots. They're, these people are also on groundwater, and it, it's just not a healthy situation, giving the density that we're pushing into that into the Freedom District. And so th that's my thought on this, is that, you know, we probably ought to be talking more along the lines of, okay, you know, there were 1,200 tomes that were taken out of the priority funding area. You know, what we did by doing that... They weren't it, taken out of the priority funding area. They were taken out of the priority sewer. 
That's it. Thank okay. you. They're they're th you thank you. That's great. They're taking it out of the priority sewer, and what we did by doing that is we basically moved moved capacity from our right pocket to our left pocket, in in my view, and I'm not so sure that we shouldn't be looking at as, as time goes on. Again, probably somebody else will be sitting up here than us, right? But at sooner or later, yes. yeah, at some, at some point, um, we're going to need to we're going to need to address this and. Um, I, I don't think we can just, you know, punt it. Well, I I do think um, that there is probably a need for the future to probably have some more discussion on that. Um, they are so. I I as I said, I get it. Um, it's not a happy thing when you're septic is not working correctly and you're faced with a change um, but aren't there some um, so if I can clarify help with that so just a couple points so we are two professionals and we have engineers as well looking at this we also work very closely with our health department we do not take issues like that lightly if there's an issue that there's a systematic failure that needs to be brought to our attention so if there are communities they need to work through the health department and work through the county public works that being said this plan does not change or, or the path forward um, there, we're not going to be putting recommendations for that what we are working on those we recognize this we understand it we have already started mapping out lines that would go to these properties um, and we're going to be working with Public Works for cost estimates and reassessing the communities. We can do an amendment to this plan. We do it twice a year automatically. Um, and so that's something we need to take a step back and evaluate. But in the meantime, this still is an area for development. We still have this underutilized infrastructure. So that is the game plan so far moving forward. Ultimately, it will be a CIP budget request for the county commissioners to have to pay for the center lines to go down and then each individual property owner would have to pay from their home to the main line and pay the area connection charges to the county so it's a very very expensive endeavor for property owner and for the county yes we know that there's grants available but we can't grant fund 1200 plus homes all at one time so it has to be done in a very thoughtful concise approach and that's what we're planning on doing okay, okay. thank you with all that in mind, we um, have a task at hand to do. So um, there is a recommendation up there if anyone is so inclined to. I could, uh, I'm closest. <laughs> I have my glasses on. <laughs> so I'll recommend a motion that the uh, Carroll County Planning and Zoning Commission hereby certifies that the 2023 triennial update to the Carroll County Water and Sewer Master Plan as it pertains to the county is consistent with the 2014 Carroll County Master Plan, 2019 Amendment, and the 2018 Freedom Community Comprehensive Plan. A second. Okay. Um, any further discussion? Okay. Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay. You have your motion. Excuse Thanks. me, Mr. Lester, did you vote? I did not. Okay, so are you abstaining? Yeah, I'll abstain on this, I think. Thank you. I appreciate you asking. There's three in favor and the motion carries with one abstention. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. On to our last, but certainly not least. Yeah. Andrew Gray, the Transportation Master Plan, Chapter 8, Emerging Trends. Thank you, well, Madam Chair. Now, Drew, it's lunchtime. <laughs> right. Can you hear our stomach? We've got 40 minutes. <laughs> oh, only be one hour. No. <laughs> only one hour. Okay. All right. Just want to be clear. Let's do this. <laughs> All right. All righty. 
Thank you all. Um, this is chapter eight of the Transportation Master Plan Emerging Trends. Um, moving through the presentation, the Carroll County Master Plan, um, the 2014 Master Plan as amended in 2019, um, mentions um, alternative transportation to improve air quality, which is supported via electric vehicle and autonomous vehicle transportation technologies. Before I started, I just wanted to to just pull this out of the current, currently adopted master plan. Um, and also, oops, sorry. So for starting with electric vehicles, the most extensive trend in the transportation world today is the transition from p vehicles powered by the internal combustion engine to vehicles powered by electrical motors for the following reasons. One of the reasons is sustainability. Our world is becoming more sustainably conscientious. According to the US EPA, transportation accounted for the largest portion of US greenhouse gas emissions in 2020. And only about 12 to 30% of e energy generated from internal combustion engines are utilized to power the vehicle, as compared to more than 77%, which is generated from electrical vehicles. Also, federal and state incentives. In 2021 and 2022, federal legislation allocated up to $9.2 billion in EV incentives. Transitioning from the internal combustion engine to electrical vehicles requires adapting our lifestyles and the way we plan the county. Range anxiety is a concern stemming from fewer charging stations in the county as compared to gas stations. Currently, there are 19 EV charging stations in the county. Um, for a geographical com comparison, in the North Carroll area of Hampstead and Manchester, there are seven gas stations as compared to three EV charging stations. One of those EV charging stations is located on town of Hampstead property, and the other is located on county property. With this being said, the county must ensure that both private and public sectors provide an adequate supply of EV charging station infrastructure for our residents and visitors alike. Just a, um, a side note with Maryland state law, um, it should be noted that in this past legislative session in 2023, the Maryland General Assembly voted to require all new single family dwellings and townhomes to be EV equipped. Additionally, Governor Moore announced a plan ending the sale of internal combustion um, engine vehicles by 2035 in the state of Maryland. What does EV infrastructure look like? EV charging infrastructure that we must adequately plan for can be divided into three different levels. Level one uses a standard 120 volt power outlet and usually takes up to 12 hours to fully charge an electrical vehicle. This is consistent with home charging without special equipment, goes right into the wall outlet. Level two is home charging with special equipment that typically charges an EV in up to about eight hours. And then level three uses a 480 volt power outlet that full, can fully charge an electric vehicle in about 30 minutes. Special considerations for electrical vehicles include, include equity concerns, which providing accessible public charging stations for all Carroll County citizens who do not have private off-street parking. Some citizens cannot charge their electrical vehicles in their driveways overnight. This segues into preventing charging deserts or areas that are often defined <coughs> as beyond a 10 minute walk from a charging station. Then economic considerations. EV charging infrastructure conveniently located adjacent to retail and businesses should be explored so customers can charge their electric vehicle while they shop at local businesses. Industrial developments will inevitably need to charge their electric vehicles, um, which would, they, they would have to, sorry, they would need um, to be retrofitted and planned for level three charging infrastructure that can fully charge the large electrical vehicle or construction equipment fast for industrial use. The county may wish to assess whether design guidelines should be implemented for EV charging stations so developers and the public alike can have clear and accessible standards when considering infrastructure installation. Quality of life will, also, will only be sustained by planning and adapting to new forms of transportation 
technology. Some of the benefits of autonomous vehicles include improved safety, supporting aging in place, reducing transportation costs only if those electric vehicles are shared, reduced congestion, and reduced right-of-way dedicated to transportation. Some of the challenges are incorporating AVs into a society that is currently dominated by human drivers and skeptics. Opportunities are clear and consistent education from all levels of government. What type of level, what, what are the different levels of vehicle autonomy? So level one is, some of us have this on our car already, for instance, driver assistance, adaptive cruise control. And it goes level one, two, three, and four, and the final um, down, the, down the chain to level five is full autonomation, which is no steering wheel in the vehicle. So just wanted to point out with positive aspects, um, environment, equity, and economy. Um, some call it the um, triple bottom line or the three E's of sustainability. Um, for the environment, narrower right-of-way widths leading to an increased areas devoted to green infrastructure and also a safer environment as well. For equity, increased traffic safety. For all, narrower right-of-way widths, as mentioned under environment, um, will lead to the enhancement of bicycle and pedestrian facilities, opportunities to revitalize urban set centers, and more public gathering places for the public, and also increased mobility for our special populations. And lastly, for the economy, to enhance the efficiency and effectiveness of travel lanes such as platooning, and also increasing trucking, trucking fuel economy by some, um, some estimates have up to 10% with platooning technology. So for uncertainties, include fiscal impacts on government revenues, such as reduced traffic violations from um, human drivers who, who don't follow all the, the traffic safety laws all the time, and shared use AVs pose reduction on registration and parking fees. Also, there are human driver safety around autonomous vehicles during the time that um, technology would be um, integrating from human to AVs and acceleration of sprawl and increased vehicle miles traveled. So to help Local governments assimilate to this new form of techno transportation technology and assist in quelling any uncertainties. The Baltimore Metropolitan Council has created a connected and autonomous vehicles working group. County planning department staff are members of the working group and provide professional planning insight on how CAVs will affect the county. The CAV work group has outlined 10 topics where action should be taken preparing for CA CAV impacts, which include travel and mobility, infrastructure, planning and land use, accessibility and equity, and the rest that um, appear on the slide. <clears throat> for shared use autonomous vehicles, researchers have predicted that there are three revolutions in urban transportation, which will be the automation, electrification, and sharing of, transporta of the transportation system. Therefore, special attention should focus on rethinking parking requirements since not as many vehicles will be privately owned and will not require as much available parking infrastructure. Thus, parking ordinances should be reviewed to make sure the right amount of parking that is demanded will be equitably supplied and located. Shared use autonomous vehicles will require loading locations both on and off the public street which should be properly delineated. Increased amounts of data collected and the use of a autonomous vehicles, any autonomous vehicles will need to be linked to the grid and may thus require communications investments all throughout the county. A major concern with local governments is what will happen to current funding sources if and when share AVs are implemented which will be further reduction in vehicle registration, sales taxes, parking revenue, and traffic fines. Hmm. And just some other transportation considerations, delivery robots, 
um, fueled by the rise of e-commerce and the ever-increasing demand for expedited shipment of goods. Any type of regulations would have to be discussed in a joint meeting with the county's eight municipalities since municipal boundary lines are not uniform across urban areas in the county. Also, unmanned aerial vehicles that are sometimes called drones and are being explored in the transport of lightweight packages, medical supplies, food, and other goods. Potential benefits of UAV transportation include reductions in traffic congestion, environmental pollution, delivery times, and transportation costs. Moving forward, we must prioritize safety, security, privacy, noise, and coordination with different agencies related to unmanned, area, unmanned aerial vehicles. And just to hint on um, advanced air mobility or the use of automated transportation technology to transport people in car cargo in a lower altitudes in places not traditionally served by aviation, which some sources have said is likely to be a commercially viable transportation option. But that is still, uh, in my opinion, um, a ways away. Um, so there are other um, transportation considerations on the slide for, for instance, EV charging roads, e-bikes, cargo bikes, micro-mobility, and mobility as a service. And then just in conclusion, um, these all are in the, in the plan, um, or the, sorry, the chapter that was sent. Goal one, provide an accessible and equitable location for EV charging infrastructure, infrastructure throughout the county. Goal two, evaluate or sorry, educate the public about EV and AV and other new forms of transportation technology. Goal three, collect feedback on how to best incorporate new technology on Carroll County's roadways. And finally, goal four, coordinate with federal, state, regional, and local agencies to implement EV and AV technology. Thank you, Madam Chair. That is all I have, and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. Uh, I don't think I do. I'm not sure I'll be around when all that's implemented. But <laughs> 2035. I, I, You're not going anywhere. I, I feel like the Jetsons. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and we, we know that this is, you know, future, um, futuristic in many ways, but we would be remiss not to yep. include, you know, some of the future trends that are coming down the pike. Some may happen sooner, way sooner than others. We already know that the city of Westminster is working on um, their project for Magic, uh, the Mid Atlantic Gigabit Initiative to look at um, the CAVs. Yes. Yeah. Um, and the states are already uh, working on passing laws for platooning, thank you, for platooning of um, vehicles as well. So, you know, again, we would be remiss not to include it, but thought it was important to, you know, bring it to your attention that we're going to be putting something in here. We know it's not all for Carroll County and a little far away is off, but. Yeah. Well, it's very interesting. Um, the one thing, the um, EV charging stations, mm -hmm. I know um, down in Annapolis where our realtor headquarters are, we have some stations there and unless you put a limit on them and start to charge after so many hours, they'll sit there all day on them, hogging them up. So mm -hmm. it's, you know, free is great except for when others also need to use it. Right, and having time considerations so everyone can equitably um, yes. use those. But that's wonderful, wonderful point, Madam Chair. Yep. Any other comments? I, I guess at some point, we probably ought to be including in the permitting process and, and on these schematics for newly approved buildings, spaces for uh, we ought to at least be considering that, right? I mean, is this something that we're, when, when do we, when do we mandate this, Linda? I mean, because 2035 is, it's, it's out there, but not really. Yeah, I mean, I think those are all good questions. I don't have the answer to that, but I think it's something we need to be considering moving forward. Yeah, Good Feeling Farm yeah. may need some uh, charging stations yeah. in their space. Yeah, just an example on that. Yeah. 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 No, yeah, absolutely. I said really one of the biggest challenges being we are where we are is infrastructure for electric grid. Right. So I know people on the eastern shore that complain because a lot of people can't put solar on their houses because there's not enough grid to take <clears> all the electric in 
in certain areas and stuff like that. Storage so it becomes issues. you got to store it. Yeah. You, 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 you got to have the battery capacity to store it. Yeah. Well, that, You're right. Yeah. And everybody drives during the day, not at night. That's right. And then I mean, yeah. cars sit at night, so that's when you want to charge it. And there's no sun. Yeah, I'm with yeah. you. Not enough battery storage. Mess. Well, I mean these the solar the uh, conversations we've had uh, kind of connects with this. You know the, the two megawatt yields or whatever in the storage and maybe there's some linkage there with EV uh, you know charging stations and things like that it's a whole, whole thing it's all mega trends all over again okay um, any other comments okay I don't believe there's any more public but yeah. any public comment I, I would say it and I've taken it more than my bandwidth today and I apologize Linda, Price, if I said anything that makes you think I don't value your opinion and expertise, please don't take it that way. You're singing in the key of C, and I've got other people can't singing in the key of F in my ear. I don't have perfect pitch. I've got relative pitch, and I'm getting a headache over this. I just need somebody to agree on this thing because um, – and not everybody's going to agree all the time, but um, I thank you for listening and appreciate it. Um, I just need, I, I, need um, I need help there because I'm, I'm not getting the same answers from people that I trust, you well, included. Well, it does sound like um, the county is working, and I will say as they work on, like the sewer issues, it's not out in front of us all the time. Mm -hmm. We may not see it. But it's behind the scenes work that eventually we will see. Mm -hmm. So we do have to have trust in that they are in the professionals doing their job. Yeah, I, and you know the, the whole uh, water and sewer conversation and, and the public comment from the engineers. I'm sitting here thinking, well, that's kind of above our pay grade, if you will. You know, it's really at uh, the planning department level and the health department level to um, you know recommend those things because there's huge budget right. impact there's huge uh, taxation impact health issues health issue impact and that's really not our role yeah. uh, our role I think in those regards are a little bit more reactionary instead of uh, you know proactive uh, you know if that makes sense um, right. So, uh, it, look, I get it. It's an issue. I remember we owned a house in Ellicott City a hundred years ago and had to connect to um, the public water, and it was five grand, and that was like thirty years ago. I mean, it's well, expensive. So double, triple. Yeah. Point. Yeah. Being so developed. I don't need to cut you no, off. No, that's okay. It, it, it's a big deal, and it's uh, there's funding. There's there's feelings. There's <laughs> There's a lot there. Yeah. I mean, and even to, you know, get into what, you know, Linda said just about having 1,200 homes, the money. I mean, what I do on a daily basis, you know, you'll see people try to develop properties and I'm in fire protection and then they have no idea when it's like, well, we're going to use our existing. Eh, no, you're not. And then they Talk find out that the amount of money to have a new line ran to a property and the, the tap fees are mm points in times hundreds of thousands of dollars for all that work so especially I mean, commercial for mm -hmm. the county to have to find a way to pay 1200 homes i mean and that's not even including all the infrastructure to get the lines to the point that they can be connected right right it's well i i do think the county will ultimately at some point in time devise something that will provide the mm -hmm. access to it but um, like redoing your septic, um, the hookups will still remain the cost of mm -hmm. um, the homeowner. Mm -hmm. and, and then the quarterly charges as well. Right. 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 Yes. Right. So, yeah. considerations. I'm happy to keep my septic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We'll let Commissioner Gordon figure all that itself. <laughs> okay. I have to talk to my colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, any other comments um, I will entertain a motion to adjourn I will make a motion to adjourn right. I second
All right. I assume we're all in favor. Next meeting, Wednesday, June 7th, 6 p.m. Oh, you railroaded that. <laughs>